Hi, everybody. Hope you are doing well. Welcome to my channel. I'm your host, Simone Bailey. If this is your first time tuning into my show, welcome and thank you for joining me. I myself am an actress from shows like Battlestar, Galactica, Stargate SG-1, Smallville, The L Word, and the video game Need for Speed Most Wanted. And I love days like today where I get to interview and chat with other actors and give us all a chance for us to get to know the person a little bit better. Also give you a chance to ask questions that maybe you've been wanting to ask. So I'm very excited and grateful for everyone here. And I would like to welcome my new subscribers. Thank you so much for your support. Hugs to all the fans and friends on our live chat and everyone watching around the world. Thank you so very much. And please show your support by subscribing and liking and sharing this video. And if you hit the bell icon, it will give you notifications on my new videos. All right, enough about that. I cannot tell you how excited I am for the show we have for you today. Joining us is someone who I think is just beautiful inside and out. She's not only an accomplished actress, but she's a humanitarian. She's passionate, funny, and just an all around good soul. Sci-fi fans know her as Lieutenant Duala on the hit series Battlestar Galactica. Today, I am overjoyed to be introduce interviewing actress Candace McClure. All right, let's bring her on. One moment. Dun, da, 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 da. <laughs> Hello. So. Hi, this is our guest of honor, the stunning and talented Candace McClure. Candace has a fantastic resume working as an actress in TV and film. Not only was she on a series regular on Battlestar Galactica, some of her other credits include Charmed, Limetown, V Wars, Ghost Wars, Supernatural, The Good Doctor, Hemlock Grove, Sanctuary, The Twilight Zone, Jeremiah, Reaper, Higher Ground, Da Vinci's Inquest, Dark Angel, The Outer Limits, and movies like Carrie and Romeo Must Die with Jet Li and Aaliyah, and much, much, much more. It is my privilege to introduce the one and only Candace McClure. Hi, Candace. Hi, Simone. And a couple of those credits were from a hot minute ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you have had just the most incredible career. I've been really lucky, you know, I, um, I didn't expect uh, this was how my life was gonna go, but I'm pretty pleased about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of being in the right place at the right time, I think, and uh, being able to work with um, incredible people that I could learn from really early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Well, I would love to dive right into our interview. Mm -hmm. I would love if you could tell us something about yourself that we might not know. Oh my goodness, oh my there's, goodness. I, think there's <laughs> there's <laughs> I think there are a lot of things. I, um, I'm sorry. I'm, well, even go. if it's I, like a, a hidden talent or a silly human trick or, or just anything. That's what I mean. I think there's like so many things. I'm, I'm such a private person, uh, generally. Um, <laughs> and she's brimming with talent, people. So that's why she's got so much to choose from. Uh, let's see. What's fun? Oh, what's fun right now? Uh, I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a gorilla gardener. And um, any of my friends who love who know me know that I love I love to forage things, especially. Like, tell me about that because I actually am very much like that myself, and I'd be curious what you do. I love a good if it's forage. At all like me. Actually, Los Angeles is an excellent place to to forage. You wouldn't think so. Um, no, I, I do it here. The only problem is, is when I bring stuff in, then I start noticing little bugs, and I'm like, oh, why did I do that? So now I put the stuff I forage outside. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of okay with the bugs. No. Um, okay. <laughs> I believe that if insects are eating them, then they're not deathly poisonous. Well, to a certain degree. Um, mm -hmm. Stay away from busy roads. Um, 
yeah, you don't want anything that's like soaked up a bunch of carbon monoxide or that dogs or animals have peed on it. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> but in Los Angeles, it's great. I mean, you can get lemons and oranges, mm -hmm. Spanish oranges. I found fennel. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody uses thyme as ground cover. Uh, so you can go come home with the whole, go for a jog and come back with the, the seasonings for your lunch, which I've done on several occasions. I've taken those lemons and that time and put them in fish and made myself a lovely lunch. My friends think I'm really, really weird about it, but it's like one of my favorite things to just be out in the world and knowing what you could use for food and medicine that just mm -hmm. other people look at as, as, as weeds and, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. It's a, a weird thing about me. <laughs> I don't find it weird at all. I am like right there with you. I love it. And um, every city's got their own thing. Mm -hmm. When I'm in the East Coast, there's different fun things to find. Uh, here in Vancouver, it's the best time of year because uh, spring, all the flowers means I can identify the weeds on the sides of the road and, mm -hmm. uh, and see what's there. I try and keep it to myself though, because you don't want to go on a walk with me because I'll get very distracted. I'll be like, ooh, motherwort. <laughs> I'm like that too, actually. And I've noticed that people that hang out with me start to adopt that. And I kind of feel like that's good. Like I kind of gave them a green thumb too. This is the plan. They will thank us <laughs> later. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great. Who inspires you to be the best that you can be? Oh my goodness. I think, I mean, doesn't everybody say their mom? But for me, it really is my mom. Yeah. Um, my mom... I've just known her to be working tirelessly uh, my whole life. Even now, uh, she works as a full-time teacher. She was teaching um, English in a night school class. Uh, a lot of the people she taught were um, new immigrants to Canada. Mm. Uh, she works on the executive board of the school board. Um, she was just elected to an executive seat. Uh, she works for the Teachers Federation here in Canada. She does. Um, she's just so active. She's got such a clear, strong voice, um, and she just has more energy than I can ever hope for. <laughs> I don't know how she does it. She still managed manages to cycle every week and mm -hmm. is always so concerned about her carbon footprint and um, yeah. waste and usage. And she's raised me like that all my life before it was popular. Uh, we were always really careful with things. Um, she was drinking gross green juice way before anybody figured it out. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, she's taught me about um, being healthy in your body and, and in your mind and, and always just showing up and doing your best. And I hope by the end of my life, I'll make her proud. I, I'm sure she is proud of me now, but um, mm -hmm. I have not yet accomplished uh, what my mother has, but we'll get there. <laughs> I think you are doing great. Well, there's something that you and I have in common, um, speaking about being conscientious, and I heard on another interview, and I was so happy that you said it, which is someone asked you, like, what is one of your pet peeves? And you said, one of them is when people leave the water running when they're brushing their teeth. And it is something that I think of too all the time. And I do the same even when I'm doing dishes. I think it's really important. Like, why would you just keep the water running <laughs> while you're actively not using it? It is such a waste of water. And if you think collectively, all the people, I mean, not to get on my soapbox, but you know, no. if you think collectively how much water people waste while they're doing dishes or whatever, you know. Especially like, because you live in California and you live in yeah. a desert that's yeah. experiencing a drought. It always blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. So I love that about you that you said that because I was like, yes, finally. You know. It has been a point of contention in my previous relationships. <laughs> they will tell you. Um, there have been we broke up efforts. because I kept the water no. running. <laughs> no, a valiant effort was made to uh, adjust the behavior. I, I yeah. Sorry, excuse my neighborhood. Um, but I can't, I can't not say something about it. And that's, <laughs> that, it actually will get to the point where I'll just walk into the room and turn it off. Like, oh. whatever you're doing, if you're washing the dishes or if you're brushing your teeth and the water's on, I will just 
I'll just turn it off, which is a little rude, but it has happened. I, you know, I think it's, um, I have a very vivid memory of being in South Africa when I was young and the, uh, the river that we lived near, the Amgeni River. I lived in a suburb growing up um, outside Durban and uh, the, there was a flood and the river broke its banks uh, and it destroyed all the water mains. So nobody was getting water to their house. And I remember having to line up for water and filtering and cleaning uh, neighbors' pool water, collecting rainwater. I, I mean, as a kid, I thought it was all a sort of grand adventure and I sort of love that kind of stuff. I'm still into rainwater harvesting and I'm a bit of an off-grid hippie. But um, <laughs> don't tell anybody. It's uh, no, I'm, so I'm a total I'll hippie. I'll up person. here and hemp down there. <laughs> Um, it was just a, such a formative memory in my mind. Uh, my grandmother was always really conscientious of the water bill. Uh, I mm. still have really sort of odd water water practices in my own private. Um, I reuse <laughs> a lot of my gray water in the house. I don't, uh -huh. let, people think I'm really weird. But at the same time, it makes me feel better about my contribution in the world. And I yeah. think water's a really precious thing. Um, and there are people who, oh my gosh, have to walk miles uh, for water that they can't guarantee is clean. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, even if it's just me feeling better about it, uh, I like to do it just, uh, yeah, to show a little reverence for it. Um, for a few years, I like to, uh, Charity Water, I love is a great organization because you can donate your birthday sort of in a way. They'll mm -hmm. give you a birthday campaign and then, um, whatever you raise on that campaign will go uh, to building wells uh, all over the world. And it'll tell you how many people you've provided clean, clean water for. And mm -hmm. uh, I love those kinds of, um, yeah, that's my family. We, I get water for my birthday. Other people get water for my birthday and we give those <laughs> significance at Christmas time. You'll know it was from one of us cause you'll get a card that says you have a goat or a chicken that you donated to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Do you name them even though they probably name them? Like, do you just no. kind of name them for yourself? Oh, no. I, you know, it's a, it's a dream of mine that one day I will have my own goats and my own chickens. But um, I kind of want a little pig, but I know they get very big. I would need a farm farm. Pigs are tough because they're so intelligent. And they and might you would, eat you at a certain point. <laughs> and you get attached to them. But really, mm -hmm. they're... I mean, really, the reason you have a pig on a farm is for bacon. <laughs> oh, it's for bacon and for uh, yeah, and for fat and for meat. And I mean, they're cute, uh, but they're really, but they're really smart. So unless you're really like steely, which I am not, um, how would you kill it after you? It's been in your house all that time. That, yeah, no, I that can't. Would, you know, I just, then they're just enormous. And will you yeah. out of house and then come after you? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I'm funny. Like growing up, I would never even think about ever living on a farm. But now, mm -hmm. as I'm getting older, I kind of fantasize about living on a farm. Oh, that was always the plan. Yeah, my best really? friend and I were. All, oh, yeah, my best friend and I. We always joked. We were just like, oh, yep, it's gonna be a couple of us, a couple of biddies. We'll see if the the boys hang around. But it's definitely gonna be the two of us. Yeah, just like um, Oprah, on you know, some land grow your somewhere. own stuff and, you know, live it up. I, I grow a little garden wherever I am. Uh, I'm in an Airbnb uh, at the moment, just temporarily uh, got sort of cotched here during lockdown and um, decided to just stay. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I wish I could show you. I'm looking at it. It's outside. But uh, I used like stuff from the grocery store. So the ends of um, scallions or cabbages, anything that you can regrow, uh, celery, okay. uh, watercress. And I planted can I, them can in I a little planter you... outside and it's so cute. I have a little garden. <laughs> can I show you something so crazy? Are we the same person? I we know. are the same person. Just wait. Oh, I can't wait. Oh no. Oh my gosh. Oh no. <laughs> what is it gonna be? Oh hi, buddy. Okay, I gotta put my gotta put my headphones in. I saw a Kay. little bit of Okay. 
everyone, I'm very strange. Now this is a sweet potato. And it was just, it had a nub that like started to grow stuff. And then I just put it in water. I'd never done this before. And it is. <laughs> so well, it's because it's trying to make little potatoes. Wait, I know. everybody hold on 30 seconds. Okay. Surprise. <laughs> okay. But I love this guy because he's grown like a little. Okay. Well, you can't see and I don't want to. Um, stress him but he's grown yeah. so much like yeah. little little heart leaves <laughs> little heart leaves and i've got like carrots and yeah anyway look it's a sweet potato <laughs> oh my god you and i are like soul sisters <laughs> we are we didn't know what the smell oh my god potato, buddy oh my gosh isn't it gorgeous <laughs> I yeah love and they've so got much. like heart heart leaves oh this is my favorite. Um, I know. I love mine so much. I almost don't want to plant them because I kind of like having them inside. And I just don't know what is fair to them because they have feelings in my mind. Of course they do. <laughs> Buddy, look how happy he is. Oh um, <laughs> That's interesting that you do it in a in a can. Well, with I never thought about that. Well, I just put them in soil right away. Any kind of potato, you kind of want to mound it. Okay. Good. All I'm those glad you're, you're mentoring me. <laughs> all those little shoots are like, are going to be potatoes, right? Are going to be sweet potatoes. So really when they start, yeah, when they start sprouting, I've actually got a little one growing as well. You kind of keep putting soil over top of it and the little leaves keep going higher up and that will turn into potatoes, but you need to give them, you know, ground. These are going to go to my mom's plot. She has a, a garden plot in the back of her home and uh, I spend a lot of time in it when I go and see her. Uh, she'll actually come and get me from the garden because I'll go in the morning and it'll be like three, four hours later. She'll come down and be like, <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, these, these potatoes are destined for the plot um, after the early potatoes come out and the sweet potatoes will go in. I've planned a, an apocalypse garden for my mom's plot. Um, my contribution is all the stuff that I've scavenged from my grocery bill, <laughs> my groceries. Yes. Uh, but I kind of love it. I think it's, I'm also obsessed with like compost and making soil, but that's just because I think it's magic. I think it's magic mm -hmm. that we can take food scraps and things from around the house and yeah. submit them to pressure and heat and time and make the medium that we can grow more food out of. Um, those kinds of like, I don't know, old new things out of old things, rebirthing sort of um, moments are are my favorite. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have oh. not succeeded in growing garlic or onions. Um, oh, well, green onions are the potatoes. easiest. Yeah, this year's I'm, potatoes. Yeah, because uh, that's a staple crop. Good for the apocalypse. Uh, <laughs> Good for the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> You're staying focused on, you know, current times. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi, guys. I saw some shout outs there. Are there? I'm getting distracted by the comments. Oh, Hi, yeah, everyone. Yeah. Let's just give, do <laughs> you mind just reading off some names just to say no, hello to everybody? Um, okay, where am I? Um, am I in the right spot? Oh, wow. There's like so many already. <laughs> we just saw a little bit. Um, Hi, Warren. Warren Burrell says, hello. Hi, hi Simone. Hi, Candace. How are you doing? Um, there's Orville Nation. Hi. Oh, thank you so much. Good. You're loving the interview. Um, great for planting some onions. Yes. I love how everybody's <laughs> like baking and gardening. And I think this is going to be the thing that gets us out of this situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's the time of the farmer. <laughs> Yeah, and everybody kind of goes back to the basics of things. I think it's also about um, being with each other, you know? It's the thing I miss. I miss a lot of things about South African culture um, and being, even though I've been in North America now longer than I've lived in South Africa, um, mm -hmm. I did grow up there. You know, I was a kid and a teenager there. Um, and it's it's a very much it's a society based around the family and 
connectedness. And that was my experience of it. Um, people, people would visit, you know, my grandmother's best friend visit her, visited her every Saturday uh, for almost 60 years. Wow, you know? I love that, yeah. She would walk, when she walked, she would walk her up the driveway. They used to live close by and they'd walk halfway between their two homes. Um, my best friend and I lived next door to each other and we would do the same thing and walk each other home and wait for the other to pass through the other's gates. Um, I still know a lot of people there. And um, it's the same thing that I loved about living in Trinidad was that, uh, sorry, I keep moving my screen, um, was that um, it was, it was a culture of people who just loved to be with one another. And I think mm -hmm. that is just such a human thing. We, we love to be with each other. We will make excuses to, to sit around and talk to each other. <laughs> and did you come from a big family or a small family? No. Um, well, on my mother's side, it's a very small family. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an only child. Uh, okay. I'm an only grandchild. I don't have any cousins on my mom's side. Uh, but my dad's side makes up for it. Uh, my dad has a really large family. Um, he has lots of brothers and sisters. They have lots of kids. I've got uh -huh. upwards of 60 cousins, first and second cousins, I'm sure. Now um, I wow. know some of my first cousins. I wish I spent more time with them because they're the side of the family that I'm most like. Mm -hmm. uh, I look like them and uh, I can see, I see some of my, like, um, I'm picturing my like uncles. 60 clones, 60 clones. We are, we, <laughs> you can actually, you can spot them a clerk. You can definitely spot oh, really? <laughs> which is handy when you're a teenager and it, you avoid dating your cousins. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're like, we're related. I can tell them we're related. <laughs> um, no, but so many, um, my cousin Jody Lee, she's has an amazing, gorgeous voice singer songwriter she's um uh, a singer in out of london um my brother my father's brothers all sang and played guitar my father is an amazing guitar player and um i just grew up around a lot of music and and big family gatherings and uh, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff so i get i guess the most best best of both worlds i get spoiled on my mom's side and get to hang out with all my cousins mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. So when you were growing up, did you grow up playing sports or music or dance or, you know, what was, what was going on in your life? Yeah. Uh, so I grew up around my mom's family mainly and um, we, weren't, we weren't so big on sports. Um, I took piano lessons uh, when I was oh. still in South Africa. Um, I took clarinet when I came to Canada. Really? Yeah, I miss the piano. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, a piano is not the easiest thing to get a hold of. Uh, my mom and I were new immigrants here in Canada, so um, didn't quite figure that one out. Um, I I play the ukulele now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always handy. <laughs> yes. I still get really nervous in crowds. Um, you have to kind of catch me on the sly or else I get all nervous and shaky, which is so weird because I'm not nervous on set at all. There we go. There she is. There that she is, is in action, people. I actually, that ukulele was my previous ukulele and uh, I left it. I forgot it at the airport by mistake and I was gone too long and they donated it and I miss it so much. Oh no. But my uncle, um, I have, I have an uncle who lives in Denmark and I went to go and see him and uh, he bought me this beautiful ukulele um, and it is smaller, so easier to travel with. Uh, it's an Everdeen and it's actually such a beautiful instrument and um, I love the sound and the more I play it, the better it sounds. So thank you, Uncle George. <laughs> Yay. He would tell me to say that in Danish and I'm trying to remember my Danish right now. Talk, <laughs> talk, Uncle George. Thank you. <laughs> so you sing and play, or do you prefer just playing? Or I really, I do the, I do the playing so that I can sing. Yeah, yeah. I, I focus. That. I focus less. It's just really there for the, you know, I'm not like 
the most amazing ukulele player on the planet. I basically have one picking pattern and one strumming pattern and pretty much every song I play sounds like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I love it. Um, how, so you, you grew up in South Africa. How would you describe mm. South Africa to people who have never been like me? I've never been. No, I'm so deeply biased about South Africa because I just, I think it's one of the most incredible places in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's so full of history and culture and I just find, I don't know, I don't even know how to, I, it's a little overwhelming to put it into words because although I feel such a deep connection to South Africa, I also realize that I've spent so much time away from it. So when I'm there, even though I'm in a place where I feel so much like myself, when I'm there, mm -hmm. I'm also still, um, in a lot of ways, I'm a visitor. Um, I grew up in apartheid South Africa. I was there for the first free and, and free election in South Africa in 94. I was in the country, but of course I was too young to vote. Mm -hmm. um, I've never voted in South Africa and, uh, and won't because I'm no longer a South African citizen. And they ended apartheid in 94, correct? 1994 was, yes, yeah. was the beginning of the new constitution. But mm -hmm. um, so in a way, growing up in sort of the class and culture that I did, there were these other worlds in South Africa that I just started to discover. Mm -hmm. um, and they are kind of separate from me because I don't have the language of them. There are 13 national languages in South Africa. <laughs> some people say 11, some people say 13. Um, yeah. uh, and there, and there's like 58 million people who live there, right? So it's like... There's a lot of people. There's a lot, a lot of, of diversity. There's a lot yeah. of diversity in terms of climate and uh, landscape, uh, in terms of population of people. but. Um, I went back to South Africa in 2010 for, for the World Cup. I've been back since uh, yeah. many times. Uh, I hope to be back at the end of this year. But um, And I, I was just so overwhelmed by how South Africa welcomed the world. And I was like, yes, mm -hmm. we are a cult. I still say we. We are a culture of hospitality and warmth. Uh, we are um, passionate about our, our country and our culture. Um, there are... I think unique stories in South Africa that have yet to be told. I think there's still so much potential, but if mm -hmm. nothing else, uh, going to South Africa, you will listen to music you have never listened to before. You will encounter vast metropolitan cities. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a happening place, <laughs> uh, between arts and culture or a busy city vibe. I've heard, diehard New Yorkers describe Johannesburg as the best of New York, New York 10 oh. years ago when it was full of like, you know, artists and musicians oh, I love that. and food and it's just all kind people just uh, coming together and, and mixing together. And uh, I just love it. Uh, you will get fat there though. Um, <laughs> Cause you will not find a bad meal. <laughs> Don't like food and go to South Africa because you will eat everything. Everybody mm -hmm. that I've brought to South Africa, I brought different producers and hosts and uh, directors and I try and steal somebody every time I go down there. Um, that's the number one thing they always say. They're like, I did not expect to eat this well. I was like, well, wow. I mean, <laughs> if nothing else, go for a culinary journey. But yeah. Um, I've still yet to explore all, all of South Africa, um, and I and I plan to um, actually. Yeah, and I learned a fun fact that the very first human heart transplant happened in Cape Town in 1967. Yeah. Um, well, South Africa was known for their medical staff for uh, for a really long time. Some of the top doctors in the world, even if you go to top uh, U.S. Um, hospitals um, and research facilities will often have uh, South African surgeons and South African doctors. 
Um, also, weirdly, in the film industry, we're also really, <laughs> Africans are really known um, increasingly now in front of the camera. We've got some really bright, shining stars coming out of South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. I know I keep saying we, but I still have my South African passport. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and now also uh, behind, always behind the camera. We have some of the best cameramen, um, DPs, directors, uh, technical people. Yeah. I'm just going to keep being super proud of, of everything. No, I, I feel you. I feel you. Have you filmed there before? I have actually. For the first time in uh, a couple of years ago, I shot a film called uh, Sew the Winter to My Skin, uh, written and directed by the visionary uh, Jamil Hubeka. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying his name right. He would laugh at me, but he would appreciate my crying. <laughs> um, and his partner, uh, partner in crime, editor, producer, Leila Swartz, um, visionary young filmmakers in South Africa. We shot a epic historical Western saga um, with no dialogue. <laughs> He pulled wow. it off. The film is gorgeous. Uh, we were South, South Africa's submission for the 91st uh, Oscars. We didn't get the placement, but we had we ran an excellent campaign. Mm -hmm. There was some stiff competition that year. And um, again, uh, the same director, Jamil, the same combo, Jamil and Layla, have Knuckle City um, submitted as South Africa's uh, official selection for um, foreign language film. Um, for the Oscars this year. So that was my first time I got to shoot in the Eastern Cape. It was stunning. Um, I hope to do more. I hope to do more. Yes. I never want to take away from, because there is an industry, there is a TV industry in South Africa um, and it's been there. Uh, it's growing. Um, it is definitely more based around television, um, but there is an industry there and there are, uh, incredible actors and actresses out of the country that uh, you know deserve those those spots and those places. So I can't just you know I can't just shimmy in there and be like, hey, <laughs> I'll I'll play the American on your <laughs> on your show. That's right. pretty much all I'm qualified to do in South Africa. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love that. Um, what was I going to ask? Are there many movies shot, shot in South Africa? Uh, Orville Nation is asking. Yes, oh. there are. you should check them out. <laughs> oh, that's There's right. um, uh, increasingly so. Like I said, it's it's definitely more um, television. Uh, there's a, I guess, a soap opera you would call it, uh, called Generations, uh, that was um, broadcast internationally for many many years. I know a lot of Americans were big fans of Generations. Uh, things like AC Dingo, but now increasingly um, more of a film industry and more of a local film, film industry. And I'm, I'm glad to see it growing. Yeah, it's a beautiful place to shoot. The light is just, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. I have a friend, um, parents' friend, who goes all the time and is obsessed with South Africa. So it's I'm a really long excited. Trip. Yeah. It's a long trip and it's from North America. You know, if you're coming from the West Coast of North America, there's no easy way to do it. I'm not going to mince words about it. It's a long and difficult trip unless you can be in the first class. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, Which, once, yeah. Once you go business class or first class, it's really, you can't go back. <laughs> I've only been once, uh, mm -hmm. graciously, thanks to uh, a producer that I was working with. Shout out Diane, um, yeah. who got me an emergency ticket back to, back to North America. Uh, and it was, she surprised me with the first class. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I love you. Yeah. But now it's it, a, now you've ruined me for the rest of my life. Cause now I got to go back to coach. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, afford, I'm not paying for this. <laughs> yeah. It's a I'm going to have to take um, trains, I think, and boats the next time. Mm. <laughs> or beam you there sci-fi style. I know. Can't we do that yet? I know, right? How did you get into acting? At what age? And what made you want to become an actress? Um, 
I know every actor says this. Uh, I was putting on plays on the front, of like on my grandmother's front porch for like mm -hmm. Mother's Day or Valentine's. I would get my neighbor's kids around and I'd like choreograph dance numbers. And I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I was just uh, entertaining myself, only child syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I really didn't think of it as a career. I sort of suffered through drama in Canadian high school. I think I would have enjoyed it more if I wasn't a sort of new immigrant with a weird accent and couldn't do my hair and a teenager, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but um, it was really by accident. The first acting role I got was basically for a South African, a 17 year old mixed race um, South African girl. So I wasn't really acting, I was just being myself and uh, I could do the accent and it was for the Fringe Festival. Um, I just graduated high school. I didn't really know what else to do. Um, this opportunity came along. I was working in restaurant jobs and uh, mm -hmm. and I did it. Um, Athel Fugard's Valley Song uh, that we did for the, the Fringe Festival. Uh, it was two-hander, me and his name is Cecil Hirschler. Um, shout out Cecil. Uh, he now, I think he's a co-founder of the Vancouver South African Film Festival now. Nice. If anybody's in Vancouver, um, it's a growing festival. Definitely support and check it out. My mom and I are always there. Um, yeah, and then just a series of really aligned, I guess, events, which I didn't quite recognize at the time. Uh, the play was about a young girl who dreamed of being a star. <laughs> Uh, we rehearsed in William B. Davis's then acting center, no longer exists, it's a condo now. Um, oh, okay. But Mr. Davis very kindly spoke to his agent about me and his agent uh, interviewed me, uh, was very skeptical about the whole scenario, um, but took a chance on me. Um, wow. And I booked, I think my first and second auditions. And so that was, um, MOW, um, and then I think I did a commercial audition. I didn't, I oh yeah, for at and and then uh, a series, and then I did Higher Ground. So I went from wow. no acting whatsoever to a play, an MOW, and uh, an ensemble series. And then after, you know, that was a year. And I, after that year, I learned so much and I was like, oh, this, like this could be a job, I could, I could do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> I could pay my rent. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. Um, that agent is still my agent. Uh, Richard Lucas is still my agent. Um, nice. The manager that I met a couple of years after that is still my manager, Ben Levine at Link Entertainment. Um, I do have, for the first time now, I have American agents. Uh, 22 years into my, <laughs> nice. into my career, I picked up some some American agents. So shout out to, to August Kamer at Talentworks. Um, mm -hmm. I know they've been, I, people have been trying to convince me to move to Los Angeles literally for 20 years. Um, you're braver than I am, Simone. <laughs> you, you did it, you really did. Well, thanks. Yeah, I've been here since 2011. But I go back to Vancouver like well, all, sure. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's gorgeous. Yeah. And why wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll get there eventually. It'll take oh, some, for sure. may maybe in the next 10 years. We'll see how I hold up. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think there's a question. Elihu Hernandez. Elihu. Sorry, I'm just over here no, doing okay. your, your, <laughs> your admin. Is it this one? Uh, yeah. Is there a job you didn't like because of the script, script. or location or the crew or the director? Now you don't have to name any. No, and I wouldn't. Uh, yeah. Well, and the, the simple answer is if I didn't like the script, I wouldn't be on the job. <laughs> well, sometimes for people, you know, money, times are tough. You oh. need to buy a thing or, you know. Absolutely, I have done jobs uh, where I've turned things down and they've come back a few times. Uh, but you know, I think we have to remember that our part of our job is is the creation of 
a fantasy and escape and sort of alternate consciousness for the people that are watching us. And one of the greatest um, things I ever learned um, in acting was, was not to judge characters um, or material or, you know, there are difficult people. I've had, I've been very lucky in my experiences. I've had a couple of mm, Hiccups. challenging work environments. I've had a couple of uh, Me Too moments, absolutely. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But I thankfully got out of things quite unscathed. Um, and I've always had really great support behind me. Richard Lucas has always been, here's the advice he gave me. Um, if you feel silly, like if you're like embarrassed or you think it's kind of cheesy or you, like you feel silly about it, um, that is not an excuse. That is you judging the work and your job is to know your lines and show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if it is something where you feel like it goes against your moral code, it is doing something detrimental to your spirit or your soul or that you couldn't come out of it mm -hmm. healthy on the other side. And I think that's something as actors, we also need to consider, um, especially when you're taking on very heavy roles or you're doing a lot of horror <laughs> like I do, uh, mm -hmm. you have to be able to kind of, you know, know where you end and begin and where you can separate and kind of de-stress from the work. Uh, and if you don't feel like you can come out of that on the other side, yourself and have mechanisms to keep yourself healthy and well, then, then don't do it, you know, but, yeah. um, film sets and TV sets, TV shows are challenging environments. There is no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently just shot a passion project. Uh, it was written, directed, created, um, by my dear, dear friend, Jean Ann Goosen. She is phenomenal. I have no doubt she's going, she's already a phenomenal actress. Um, with these plans of writing and directing, I, I see her going so much further. I'm so excited to work with her and we shot, she threw together a little web series, um, five or six episodes. We shot it all in one week, uh, very professionally done, but you know, it was a love fest over there. Like, I love her. <laughs> I knew the yeah. other uh, Keon Alexander. We have a great time together. Um, I'm running around doing wardrobe and production design, help, you know, assisting with production design. And like, we all loved each other, but it is still yeah. long hours. Got to get the takes. You, you really have to, everybody's pulling their weight. And the more you uh, identify with that and make friends with the crew. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> The easier make, make a lot of everybody. allies. Make a lot the of easier allies. It is for everybody. It's long hours. It's hard work. I know it looks really glamorous, uh, but the hours are long and the tensions are high. And sometimes you just got to put it in your pipe and smoke it for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Get the scene done. Um, mm -hmm. And then we can, you know, we can have an action, after action report. We can debrief about uh, yes. what happened and what should have happened and all those kinds of things. But um, I came up in the industry around, I learned what I learned on set. Uh, I didn't go to school. I don't have a degree in this. Uh, I've always felt kind of like an imposter because of it. Hmm. But I do have 22 years on set experience. And the number one thing I've learned is that we are definitely all in this together. Um, true, I'm the one that you're filming, but it's a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> you know who else does not have formal training but is phenomenal is Brendan Fletcher. Oh, well. He, like no. you, is a complete natural. I appreciate that. I think you're being overly generous because Brendan Fletcher is one of the most phenomenally talented actors I have ever met in my life. I've known him, oh God, it's got it. Oh yeah, 20 years. <laughs> I met Brendan a long time ago. Um, yeah. He, he taps into something. I saw him in a production of Equus. Oh my God. Yeah, I saw that too. Amazing, incredible. Incredible. So and he just primal. Keeps, He's just got instincts. Like it's the instincts, and yeah. he again, he doesn't judge them. He does. He just like 
throws himself at them. <laughs> Beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I left my sunglasses in his car 15 years ago. I don't think either of those things still exist, but I miss those sunglasses. <laughs> you never know. You never know. So I heard you in an interview talk about uh, during this time you've been uh, going onto YouTube and practicing accents. What accents have you been brushing up on? I, I won't ask you to do any unless you oh, want it. Terrible. <laughs> um, I'm just curious which ones you would work on. Well, there's sort of the br brushing up of the ones that are kind of already in my repertoire. I've done right. I've done some voiceover work uh, in a British accent. Mm -hmm. um, although you know you you do. What I realized is that I needed to upgrade my skills because the the Julie Andrews version of a British accent that I was rocking out in Barbie movies uh, long ago is not is not the accent that um, there's more variety now. We yes. know more about all the different dialects. Uh, we have a lot more brilliant actors uh, and actresses that are coming out of the UK, and so we we start to learn about all the differences in the way people sound and there's it's not all like Julie Andrews. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, well, I, I'm such a fan of Michaela Cole. So I've been watching her new new show. I think I May Destroy You. Is it I May Destroy You? I think that's what, something like that. Anyway. I don't know. Um, I've done a lot of work as a... Uh, oh, we have someone from Paris. <gasps> oh. Hello. Uh, Bonjour. I know what time of day is it? Is the afternoon? Oh, <laughs> is it bonsoir. <laughs> bon matin. <laughs> um, yes, speaking and then and then French. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, I I learned French on my Duolingo. I'm not very good. I only you know sort of know. Oh, how someone to say. wants you to do the Northern Ireland accent. <laughs> do a Northern? How how would I do a Northern Ireland accent? I've never done an Irish accent. I have Irish blood, so maybe I should be able to do an Irish accent. McClure is an Irish name, uh, I've come to find out. Oh. Uh -huh. I thought it was, I do have Scottish in my family on one side, but McClure is an Irish name, which hmm. makes a lot of sense, uh, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Potatoes I've, I've and Irish tendencies. <laughs> Potatoes, a temper, a quick sense of humor. Uh, don't take myself too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna torture anybody with uh, with any of my accents until I practice them a little bit better. No, it's all good. Um, what? So you spoke about working in restaurants. What other jobs did you have before you were an actor? That's it. Oh, that's it. Waitress? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very briefly a waitress. I was a terrible waitress. Um, <laughs> I did Were you ever a hostess? I was definitely a hostess. Um, I was more a hostess. And then I worked in kind of a, um, I guess it's a fast food restaurant. It's, it was, it's a very popular South African chain called Nando's here in Canada. It was bought by Nando's Canada. Uh, still very popular. Um, yeah, I used to yeah. work at Nando's. Oh, um, nice. <laughs> I mean, I had, um, uh, my mom likes to remind me I've been working since I was 12 years old. <laughs> um, I started babysitting. Um, my mom volunteered at a local newspaper when she first immigrated here, and I would help out at the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would, I bagged groceries. Um, and then, yeah, I got into the restaurant industry and now here. I mean, still to this day, I, I pick up odd jobs. Um, uh, I have assisted um, a costume, a key costumer on a film and a couple of commercials. Um, I was the hair and makeup and the wardrobe department on the, on the last series. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll pick up. I volunteered for a major music festival. 
uh, just to learn about logistics. I've worked in a warehouse uh, for Sage, um, the company Sage. Uh, I packed boxes in their warehouse. I'll, I'll pretty much do anything. I, I just love new experiences and meeting new people. And I like, um, I like learning about new things. So I'm also a, I need to do things to learn them. Yeah. I'm not great about sort of theoretical things. So yeah, if you want to learn about logistics in a warehouse, go work in a warehouse. Well, it's <laughs> At also, the time I just needed a job, but yeah. <laughs> but it enriches not only your life and you get to meet new people, but it also gives you a window into things that inform characters that can help with acting and things like that. Absolutely. I, I feel, that's, yeah. that's kind of the sneaky thing about it is that a lot of the times I'll be in these environments and uh, kind of just soaking up the people watching. The thing is though, um, actors make actor choices. They, we don't always make people choices. Do you know? Like oh, the I, people, I do. I make people well, choices. Because I'm like, I've been an obsessive, not obsessive, but like I really, am hyper focused on very fine details with people because yes. I find well, that them kind of psychologically stuff. very fascinating. That kind of stuff. The way mm -hmm. people will say one thing but sort of betray themselves with their eyes or their body language or their tone of their voice or you know the unconscious things that people do that indicate how they're really feeling. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But most of the time the choices that you encounter in characters in a script are not that's how I describe them. They're not people choices. They're, they're actor choices, they're character choices because they need to drive the story forward, right? And right. it's about taking these kinds of bold moves, uh, um, hero choices and villain choices and uh, you know, really extenuating circumstances and, and creating that humanity for them. So we, we fill them in with, um, yeah, so. So little things like that will find their way into my work just because I've soaked them up. I, I remember at Sage, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten her name, but I was, um, one of the forklift drivers was a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, they hire a lot of women uh, at Sage Natural Wellness, big up Sage. Um, but one of the <laughs> forklift drivers was a woman and she could handle this machine like nobody's business. And she had this way of like hopping on and off it. Of course, she was always safe. It was a really safe work environment. Uh, one of the best work environments, actually. Um, but I was just so fascinated by how she uh, handled this machine. She had such a sense of humor. She would kind of call out to, to everybody. There was real camaraderie a lot of the times um, in the warehouse. And those little things. So it's like, you know, where can I put that swagger? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the work somewhere. I know you get it. No, yeah. it's great. I think it's great. Okay. I want to talk about Battlestar Galactica. You yeah. had a, yes, you had, oh, I love that show so much. You had mm -hmm. a regular role as Lieutenant Dwala. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience working on the show, and I'm sure you had no idea how big the show would be. And when did it finally hit you? Yeah, uh, I was such a young actor. I, I often describe Battlestar as kind of my college years. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's not true. Um, there she is. Oh, look at the baby. Oof. So she radiant. Is, she is a baba. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call my plants. I'm like, hey, baba. Or like I a dog, just too. Wanna give, yeah, buddy. I just want to give her the biggest hug. Um, I'd say higher ground. So I came out of high school, and higher ground was college. Uh, it was an ensemble cast. I was working with all these other actors. It was a you know, big production. I'm learning all these very basic things about acting and being on set. And Battlestar was like my master's degree because I got to I got to act opposite Edward James Olmos and oh. uh, and not often Mary McDonald, but I got to be in her presence enough times. But everybody, everybody on that show, everybody I ever had scenes with, um, with with Tomo, with Katie Sackoff, 
um, didn't get to work too much with Trisha Helfer, but again, extraordinary, extraordinarily gifted people. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, what? Every, <laughs> you know? um, so I, I was really definitely kind of in my own internal world. That's not new. I'm, I'm I like that uh, a lot anyway, but um, a very only child syndrome, but, um, <laughs> but I guess I, I say that to say that I wasn't entirely concerned with like the public facing side of it. Mm. Um, it was, you know, it was just meant to be the job for the mini series. And then uh, right. they called back and said, Oh, I've got a year option deal. Wow. Uh, so that was very exciting. Um, having a character that wasn't sort of in the original show or in any of the, the Bibles, as they call them, the character Bibles for the show where you had any clues. So, Oh, <laughs> um, uh, and, um, so every script and every opportunity, I was just like looking for clues, like, who is this person? How am I going to play her? Um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of me in her as, as a young actor, definitely. I didn't really, uh, yeah, I was just really singularly focused on kind of not messing it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the beginning, uh, it was the premiere date um, of the series series. And they flew us to Los Angeles for the premiere. And Tom O'Pennicott and I, um, Tom O'Pennicott and Alonzo Oyarsson um, were sharing a hotel room. <laughs> okay. Uh, on Sunset. And we were driving there. And we saw... Uh, the poster on the side of the building driving down sunset. We saw Eddie's face, we saw Battlestar. And I was like, wait a second, this is not some like, excuse me for saying it, but you know, campy space show. Yeah. That we're gonna whip out. Uh, this is a big, big deal. Um, that photo from that premiere, if anybody can find it, is one of the most hilarious and one of my favorite photos of all time because we are all so ridiculously dressed, all of us. Every single one of us has like stripes or neon or lace or satin or tutu or <laughs> every single one of us looks ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but we were having the time of our lives. We were all just so excited. We were just like, oh, you know. What, this, this was at the, the, the premiere of? At the premiere of Battlestar. LA premiere of Battlestar, okay. Yes, look for that photo. It's definitely out there. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know. I was wearing leg warmers, okay? I was wearing orange and pink oh, what? leg warmers and a mini skirt. That's all I'll say. Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, and I guess for for what it's worth, um, it's a weird thing to say, but I always thought of it as like not my show in a way. Um, in that I definitely, I was like, I'm a supporting character. You know what I mean? Like hmm. I'm here to support the leads of the show. And I, I didn't seek the spotlight. It was something actually that my manager to this day gets on my back about because he was just like the whole time he was always like, "They're writing for you. They, re you know, let's make the most of this." And I was like, "No, no, no, it's not my show. You know, mm -hmm. it's Katie's show. It's it's Trisha's show. It's Grace's show. Mm -hmm. They they are the main drivers of this storyline, and I don't want to kind of kick kick up a fuss about mm -hmm. anything." Um, but, um, yeah, I, I always just felt like I was learning from, from those women and those people. Um, but yeah, contrast that with the fact that we, you can't always know about the like commercial success of things. It's such a crapshoot, even when people, you know, studios spend an incredible amount of money on things. Mm -hmm. Um, but what we did know was the way it felt yeah. and it was immediately uh potent we all connected mm -hmm. um 
we all galvanized around the writing and around Ron Moore. Eddie yeah. and Mary filled those roles, you know, of being the leaders of that show. Uh, they were our parents and guided us <laughs> and um, <laughs> and got us in and out of trouble, well, out of trouble and kept us from getting into trouble um, <laughs> and kept, you know, joy and, uh, uh, and, and pride and truthfulness in the work and character, um, an integral part of that show. And it, it came from the top down. We all knew that what we were doing was something special and different. You could feel that on set. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Even well, the time I, when I you just were squeaked, there. Towards I just the end. Sure. in at the end, yeah. But you could feel it. it I, I, I mean, Eddie said this when we started, and us all young kids, we were all like, oh, Eddie, you're the riot. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I've been doing this for 50 years, and this is the best piece of television. This is the best piece of work. I. Not only did he say I've wow. ever done, but that I will ever do. And we're like, you're crazy. You're, you're like, you were in Blade Runner, but yeah, okay. and stand by me, and like yeah. all these things. And I don't, I don't think he meant to put those down, but because it was this groundbreaking way that we were telling a story uh, in genre television, but that we were humanizing it, and it was topical and prescient, uh, that it was something that was going to be different than anything he had ever worked on. And he literally said to us, I'm sorry, he was just like, enjoy it while it lasts kids because it's all downhill from here. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No. Um, there's just never, that, that lightning in a bottle, it was lightning yes. in a bottle. And that's just, it's incredibly difficult to capture. I've had moments of it on other shows um, for kind of different reasons, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cast members and, you know, writing and all these things. But um, there's always something that draws me to a project, absolutely. Uh, but that like combination of people and, um, and, and work uh, is like a dragon I've been chasing for 22 years, literally. Yeah. <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 22 years? Has it been that long? Well, no, 22 years of, of oh, the I'm time like, I shot it, but it okay. has been 17 years since the first episode. Really? Almost, is it closing on 20? Holy it's getting smokes. there. It's getting That's there. That's crazy. It doesn't feel like yeah. that long at all. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, Ronald Moore has gone on to do. Yeah, that's A million true. epic things that we all enjoy. Actually, I need to catch up on my latest season of Outlander. Oh yeah, I have a here. lot of girlfriends that are obsessed. I had to take a break because I was like getting too invested. <laughs> <laughs> I crying, I had a huge crush. I was just like, okay, I need to focus. <laughs> yeah, Call, calling in sick to work because you know too much is going, going on. It's outlander right? related, right? Pulling a pulling a subsequent Portlandia, but with Outlander. Yeah, <laughs> um, just. To uh, talk about Battlestar a little bit more, you did such an amazing job on the show. And okay. um, spoiler alert for those who still haven't watched it, um, cover your ears, but your character uh, commits suicide um, yeah. in, in, in the end for your character, uh, obviously. And... And you just played that scene so beautifully. Did how much time did you, as an actor, know in advance that that was coming? And also, did the other cast members know that that was going to happen, or do they keep that kind of thing a secret? Um, it was an odd time. Um, there had been a writer strike. Okay. Mid season. And we had shot um, Revelations, I believe. And we didn't know whether the show was going to come back. We thought that that may be the end of the series. Um, who knows how long the writer check was going to go on. Mm. And I remember Michael Nankin, uh, sorry, Michael Weimer, um, our esteemed director. Uh, he directed the pilot 
mini series. And um, yeah, we sort of shot shot it in a way that it, potentially that was going to be the end of the series. And so when we came back, I hadn't heard anything about it. And at this point, we're getting to sort of the end of the show. So things are really locked down. Um, mm -hmm. You have to remember, Battlestar was before Twitter. But I remember them asking us to get Twitter accounts. I did not. Mm -hmm. I should. <laughs> I know. I was very late to the game. Very late. Yeah. Yeah, I was like 10 years late. <laughs> yeah. No, me too. I was very, very late because I was like, ah, oh, it's not a thing. It's not a thing. Oh, yeah. I, I was just like, what do you want? Like, what am I going to tweet about? Do you know what I mean? Like, does do people want to know what I'm making for lunch? Because that's basically <laughs> what I'm doing when I'm not on set is I just cook. Like, I mean, cooking and in the garden. I don't know how exciting that's going to be. Turns out it's exactly what I should have been tweeting. But yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just a very private person otherwise. Um, but the blogs, this was one of the first shows where the audience had such a direct connection um, to the writers and the creators of the show because they would read those blogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people were guessing about the outcome, outcome and who is the silent and what's gonna happen or are they gonna find Earth and all the rest of the stuff. So they were really keeping sort of company secrets very, very close to the best. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was number 13 on the call sheet, and that is a real thing. <laughs> um, so I didn't quite get the memo. Uh, I didn't know, coming back into the series, that that was going to happen. And I think from the time that I learned about it to the time we shot it was about a week. <gasps> oh, no. That must have been so heartbreaking because like, I, yeah. ha I mean, we all have major pangs when a show is coming to an end, especially when you've been with like your family for so long. Exactly. I will <gasps> say, um, I did give Mr. Moore beans about it at the time. My lippy 20 something year old self was like, why did you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I thought we were a family. But can you can I say like um, Chris Haddock, who is a major you oh. know yeah creative in um, Da Vinci's Inquest, gave me yes. one of my first jobs. Chris Haddock, shout out to Chris Haddock. Yeah, yeah. he gave me my first uh, regular role on a on a show. But his whole thing is he never wanted you to even have a script more than a week. He actually yeah. just wanted you to have it for like maybe three days before filming. And one of the reasons he did that also is he didn't want you to subconsciously as the actor play, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. die or I'm gonna kill someone or this character is yeah. gonna die or whatever because yeah. he thinks that you will kind of project it without meaning to. You know, like I said, I was a total brat about it uh, <laughs> when, when it happened. Yeah. I was just devastated and um, and it meant that I was leaving a show that um, was basically my entire life at the time. Yes. They were my friends, um, my family. Um, it's where I spent all my time. Um, I still know all these people to this day. Uh, mm -hmm. They still put up with me because I am the worst about keeping in touch. And they still <laughs> love me and I love them for it. Um, yeah. But uh, once the dunce, dust settled <laughs> and I brought myself towards myself, as we say, um, I understand that it is in service of the show. I, I always understood that our jobs are in service of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an amazing run and they gave me a beautiful exit episode. I oh. could not have asked for a better episode uh, than such a great notion. Um, Michael Nankin, Nankin, not Nankin, sorry, I'm re reading somebody saying, bring Candace back as a Cylon and it's like, oh, I just <laughs> No, I'm sorry. <laughs> you no, know, only it made me think that, um, I think mm -hmm. my understanding was that initially, the initial story was that I was the fifth Cylon. Um, Anastasia uh, was, uh, 
I think it means resurrection, and that was the name of the Cylon based ship. Oh, interesting. Uh, but you guys figured it out. <laughs> and they changed it. Oh. Because the blogs had gotten onto it already. Anyway, that's the scuttlebutt. But uh, yeah. so, you know, there were a lot of conflicting feelings around that. But. Um, it was in service of the show. I think as difficult a role, uh, as difficult a moment as that was to play. And I definitely don't mean to idealize uh, suicide at all. Um, you have to feel like you are in a really impossible place for, for you to feel like that is a, a choice and um, a sense of freedom. But I did want to give it as much dignity as I possibly could. Um, because for some people that is um, a, a feeling of uh, the relief of pain and of control over their lives. Um, I will say if anybody is having dark and difficult thoughts, please reach out. There are people there who understand and there's you're not broken, nobody's trying to fix you but there are other ways of looking at the world. Um, and for people who have had experience with it, who have survived it, or who have friends or family members that have made that choice, it's, it's a devastating thing. Um, but I wanted, I wanted Duala to be left with the sense of having done everything she could, having told everyone she loved, that she loved them yeah. um, and of having a sense of peace. Because yeah. it is a very human thing. It's a very human thing. Sorry, I'm gonna grab. I'm really, oh, really trying. Oh, no. I am trying not to cry. <laughs> no, I am trying not to cry. Um, and we all, we all cried when that happened to your I character. Cried. Oh, of course you did too. I mean, yeah, it, uh, yeah. 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 We, I was in Australia. We <laughs> I was in Australia at the time. Thank you. I love you guys too. Mm -hmm. um, BSG fans, sci-fi fans, genre fans, I have to say, are some of the best fans in the world. You guys show up and show out. Uh, I've never had fans who know more about my character. <laughs> yeah. Um, and who are so loyal and so committed. Uh, it, you know, every convention that I go to, it, I just love seeing how everybody's there for like each other, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. And by and large, I just find sci-fi fans like so intelligent, so engaging, so accepting mm -hmm. um, of, of lots of ways of being in the world and, and inclusive and intersectional. And I'm really, I'm really proud to be um, kind of a genre actress. You know, I know that was kind of a dirty word for a long time. You know, you wanted to be on network. Uh, you wanted to be on the big shows, and uh, sure we do, but I really love genre television and and film. I think yeah. it's collaborative and creative, and uh, and we've positioned ourselves well. Uh, it turns out because <laughs> everybody wants to watch it. <laughs> there well, she is. Yep. So yeah, we do have a question from the audience. Are you still doing conventions? I would say yes. She is. Well, considering we're in the middle of a global pandemic and um, because I have been out uh, protesting and marching for racial justice, um, I'm currently back self-isolating um, mm -hmm. for the next couple of weeks. I know yeah. there are some virtual conventions uh, that are happening. Um, I am scheduled to be at Dragon Con this year. Oh, when's that? Uh, Dragon Con is the end of August. Excuse me. Okay. End of August, first week in September. Have you not been to Dragon Con? No, I have not, but I've heard oh, of it. Your fans are gonna they're gonna let you know about I'm Dragon I'm Con. actually fairly newish to conventions. I've only done three and then I had one oh. for August and it already yeah. Been pushed for a year, and then I have another one in November in England. But we'll, well see. There you go. We'll see. Yeah. If you know, I'm I'm hoping you know. 
Yeah. We're all healthy globally, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I'm, I, I defer to the people who know better. Uh, I certainly don't want to put anybody at risk. Um, mm -hmm. It's great to be able to meet the fans. It's great to be able to meet people who you, your work has had an impact on. Yes. Um, Dragon Con is one of the greatest parties uh, in yeah. the world. If, oh my goodness! Uh, maybe I, it's, maybe it's I need too to much just of a party. Crash. It's a bit too much of a party for me. Um, you can get into a lot of trouble if right? <laughs> Dragon Con. <laughs> but people are just so warm and friendly, or you know, the the cosplay is incredible. The, the skill level of people who make uh, who do cosplay. My friend Kiaoku Inui. Used to be an actor. Uh, he's since moved on, but still yeah. an incredible cosplayer. Um, yeah, I, I just yeah, you you get to instead of uh, you know that screen or the camera, uh, you actually get to connect with the people who sat in their living rooms and gave of their time to to watch you to watch yeah. your work, and it impacts them. I love hearing people's stories about how you know. It brought him and his dad back together because they watched the show or somebody was in hospital and that, you know, the show got them through a tough time or mm -hmm. um, I've watched it for the third time and this is the first time my wife's watched it and she loves oh. it. And I, you know, yeah. I love all those things. So it's, it's great. Plus they, they treat you great. So um, it's definitely a, a party atmosphere most of the time. <laughs> yeah. It is work. It is absolutely work. Uh, but yeah, happy to do it. So if Dragon Con happens uh, in August and everything's safe, I, I, it might, it's touchy. Dragon Con's a very, it's a full contact convention. I, I'd say, <laughs> I'd describe it that way. <laughs> so we'll see. A lot of close but, hugging and selfies. Very, very close. Yeah, lots of <laughs> <laughs> elevators and uh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Do you, somebody's trying to get me to get you into trouble. Not me, honey. There's plenty of people at the convention who will get Simone into trouble. Not me. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, it's true. She is a fabulous guest. So we had a question, and this was also my question, just to finish on Battlestar. Did you get to keep anything from the show, either wardrobe or props or anything like, ah. Oh. Well, Here's the thing. I'm just a very obedient, uh, naturalized Canadian. No, um, I am too. I am too. <laughs> yeah. My family, we're, we're rule keepers. I was definitely raised to be like a follow the rules kind of, kind of person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I didn't, uh, cause they were very stern with us about not taking anything. And, um, it actually, there was a moment where they were like, asking wardrobe to wait outside our trailers to make sure that we weren't taking anything. Yeah. Which was a bit weird. Um, I wish I had taken my uniform. I have my dog tags. Yeah. Um, oh, that's I have cool. some money. Um, I have uh, some of the paperwork from my desk. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I have the binder. Uh, we did a boot camp before we started filming as kind of a team building, you know, exercise. It was great fun. Uh, but we have, they gave us these little binders. Um, so I have like uh, my role on the ship and what that actually meant, you know, to be the weapons specialist or the communications officers and like which part of, I had to do a whole presentation. So I still have that binder, but um, that's it. I wish I'd taken my headset and I wish I had my green BDUs. Uh, they were so comfortable. I. I miss them. <laughs> what did you do in boot camp? Um, it was like military boot camp. It was like, like army crawling. <laughs> yeah, it was five thirty a.m. PT. Uh, we had to make our beds. Um, we had bed check. We had uniform check. Oh, uh, you Tom slept. You slept there for we a week. There. I think we were there for like. Four days, maybe something like that. Four or five days. Okay. Three, four days. Um, Tom O'Pennicott uh, forgot something. I think he forgot his hat 
or brought his hat or, and we had to do knuckle pushups on the gravel until he went downstairs and fixed it. Tom up and No, it was great. Um, yeah, we like, wow. Um, rescue missions. We had to carry somebody through the woods on a stretcher. We had to get everybody up over a wall. We learned how to walk in squads. Um, each of us had a turn to lead the squad. Uh, we would eat together. We would do PT until we almost threw up. Like they really exercised us. It was pretty intense. Um, <laughs> we had to do presentations on our jobs on the ship um, as if those were our jobs. Uh, wow. It was great. I loved yeah. it. I love stuff like that. I love, you know, immersive. Um, and, and it did, it, it brought us together. Um, mm -hmm. Those team building exercises brought us together. It made us a crew. It made us, we looked out for each other. Yeah, it's great. I love that. That is so cool. Have you had any other uh, shows that made you do that, like train for fights or stunts or? Yeah, um, I wish I have done, would do more stunt training. Um, our girl Sharon, I mean, such a boss. Well, she, <laughs> for for when she was on Sea uh, with Jason Momoa, they went to like a visually impaired camp because everyone is blind on the show, so they had to right. learn also how to yeah fight. I have done that uh, for Dark Angel. I I went to the Canadian Institute for the Blind and did their um their course for the newly blind for people who are losing their sight uh, mm. as adults or as you know yeah, not born with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done kayak lessons, uh, I've done dance choreography, I've done crazy stunt jumps. Uh, some of the hardest stunt training I ever did was for Seventh Son for that movie, and they didn't even use any of it because uh, Rorley it was uh, leagues <laughs> better than I was <laughs> at all the stunt fighting. Uh, shout out to, to Rorley. Um, a phenomenal actress and, and stunt performer. Uh, so she really is in the movie. My face is in it, but she's doing all the heavy lifting. Um, yeah. I bruised myself uh, phenomenally falling, not being able to do tumbles and not being able to do all the crazy flips that, that they needed me to do. But I tried, I tried, I, I did the training. Um, kayaking i've had dj lessons yeah um taekwondo <laughs> um i did actually kickbox uh the mm -hmm. same place that sharon teaches i went to that exact school for two and a half years yeah was she your teacher no oh. <laughs> yeah this was a long time ago but yeah. I, I think i only have my high orange belt she would laugh at me she's a black belt <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So I've gotten to do a really, I've gotten to do a lot of cool things. It's it's sort of what kept me coming back to acting was because uh, of all the cool stuff that I got to do. I was like, oh, I don't actually have to be a doctor. I can just play one on TV. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I want to be respectful of your time. I could keep, oh, right. I, I mean, I've got, no, like if you're good, I would love to keep yeah. talking to you. Are you a good sure. for, okay. Yeah. You just let me know. Cause I, I, I have so many questions I want to ask you. Um, just a quick one. Do you have any pets? Are you a cat or a dog person or neither? Oh, I, I don't have any pets. Um, I, I wish I could. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I travel around so much. I haven't had a permanent um, home for <sighs> four years now. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Is it because yeah. you're jet setting with all the, the, work? Yeah. Uh, I, I lived in Trinidad and Tobago for a period of time. Like I said, that was my last kind of official home. And when I left there, uh, things were just kind of all over the place. I'd taken a break from acting. I was coming back to the acting. Uh, I just moved in with my mom. <laughs> and then, because yeah. um, sometimes we need our mamas. And, uh, um, and then I, I've just been moving around so much. I mean, before um in the before times <laughs> before the pandemic hit yeah uh, those last six months uh i mean i had been to 
Los Angeles, Jamaica, Toronto, Denmark, um, Germany, Miami, Nova Scotia. I mean, like it just never wow. it didn't seem practical because every time I'd get a place, I would just have to sublet it and it was weird. Uh, and then Airbnb is a thing. So I do have a network um, of people uh, graciously around the world um, where I know I always have a place to stay with them. Um, so that's really lucky of me. So do and, you not, sorry to interrupt, but do you just not have, like, you just travel light? Like, you don't have a lot of things that, like, possessions that you store? I got rid of a lot of things. Yeah, I got rid yeah. of a lot of things. Uh, like I said, I, I had a home in, in Trinidad. Um, and when I left there, it took me a few years to go and get my stuff. So that was the first mm -hmm. thing, is that I, yeah. I left everything that I had ever bought or possessed that wasn't at my mom's house, which was clothes and books. Yeah. I left in Trinidad and they stayed there for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I went back and got them, but I had a house full of stuff, but no house. So um, a friend of mine had a house and no stuff. So I just, uh, <laughs> she just took all my stuff. <laughs> So it was great. <laughs> I didn't right. have to like sort through anything or have a garage sale or have any kind of like moments about anything. It was just all gone. Um, right. I'm left with um, the clothes that I love the most. Um, yes. Because I'm a bit of a clothes collector. Um, they're all at my mom's house and books. I have one storage space uh, in Toronto. Again, clothes and books and shoes. Mm -hmm and my, at my mom's house and then um the sort of suitcase and backpack that i that i travel with and wow that's really all i need yeah that's so freeing it's not for everyone i mean i've yeah. slept on some uncomfortable couches uh i remember um my ex was like he dropped me off at a, an airbnb and i was staying with and he's like Wow, you really live anywhere. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what are you insinuating? What are you going to say? <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and while I am really susceptible to my environment, I definitely take on the energy of my environment. So I like to be in very bright places like this is. Um, yeah. I don't really care. Like, there's not much furniture in this apartment. There's a, a couch, a bed. Uh, two bar stools um, and two chairs on the deck. And uh -huh. that's really all I need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even that's a lot. <laughs> this is the most furniture I've had in a long time. It is very freeing. I like being able to get up and go uh, whenever I want. It's not for everybody. It's, it's a life of uncertainty um, and instability in a lot of ways. Um, but I, my practice is feeling at home in the world, no matter where I am. And that, um, and that my circumstances do not define me. That uh, I can wear clothes from Value Village, which I do most of the time. This is secondhand. <laughs> um, or, or I can be, you know, in a, in a penthouse in Yorkville. Uh, I'm still the same person. Yeah. I still have the same values. Um, I will still treat people the same way. Um, I will indulge the hell out of a spa at the Ritz, uh, but I yeah. can also, you know, I'll make a hair mask out of av some avocado and um, be just as happy. <laughs> I haven't tried that. Eh, split ends, you know, egg yolks, avocado, you know. He, I, I like making do with, that's also part of the fun for me, is I like making do with what I have. I like figuring things out with, like, how can I, how can I make this thing that I want or be in this place that I want to be in or go and do this thing that I want to try? How do I, how do I make mm. that happen <laughs> with what I have available to me right now? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's incredible. I think you're, uh, what I've realized is how similar you and I are and also how humble you are. 
We should hang and out more, first of all. <laughs> well, because yeah, you love cooking and gardening. I'm like all I'm like I'm here for it. Yeah, totally. We have matching sweet potatoes. So. <laughs> yeah, they could be I best mean. friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> oh. So I just wanted to ask, um, as we're on the cusp of uh, produ film productions coming mm. back, I've not really had this conversation with anyone. And, you know, you and I are, yes, we're in our own self quarantine to be safe. Um, and I'm curious for someone like you, who is such a coveted actress, who's constantly, in my opinion, working all the time, how do you feel? I mean, you know, what do you feel, whatever yeah. you're comfortable saying, like, how do you feel with things opening up, like, um, safety wise? Or have you had a conversation with other actors about mm -hmm. how they feel about that? I have, and it, it's really, you know, it's across the spectrum. People are worried, uh, and rightfully so. I mean, thank you for saying that. That's very kind. Um, I do hope to be working all the time. <laughs> no, um, I, am I feel like I'm you saying. are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's yes. why it, it actually shocked me <laughs> when you're like, oh, I took a break from acting. I'm like, what break? You're always working, like in my opinion, but yeah. Yeah, I guess it was a break for me because I was away from the Los Angeles, Vancouver, Toronto industry. I did some independent filming in Trinidad. I'm very proud of that work. Uh, Moving Parts, the movie, if anybody wants to check it out. Also, <laughs> Salty Dog, the short that I shot with Ollie Milne. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and started trying to learn about producing and if that was a fit and um, directing and kind of looking at other ways into the industry. Um, I'm actually scheduled to be on, on set in a few weeks. Um, <gasps> wow. I was surprised. Yeah. Um, I'm hopeful. Um, but I, but I think it really is going to depend on the production. And I think it's going to change in a lot of ways that, uh, I don't know that we can entirely anticipate. So um, this production coming up, um, I think I can say it. I signed the paperwork. <laughs> whatever, um, whatever you're comfortable with, obviously. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it was a film called Unlocked, um, uh, written and directed by Neil Blomkamp. He is, oh, wow. um, a director, the director of District 9, uh, South yeah. African Heritage. Um, yeah. we weirdly, oddly went to school together and met in <sighs> high school very briefly. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Um, he he didn't he didn't stay there long. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I've always admired his work. I thought that what he did on District Nine was really forward thinking. Um, he I assumed him to be, and my experience of him so far uh, is really a person who has at his fingertips all the kind of tools and mechanics um, of, of filmmaking. And he can kind of, even in conversation with him, like in his mind, he'll just move things and shift things around. Like he understands the building blocks of filmmaking so well that he's able to just kind of move things around and put things into play, develop and, and um, uh, yeah, just even in conversation with him, it's really, um, exciting, uh, mm -hmm. creatively. Uh, it's a very small production. There are very few actors. Um, all my scenes are, I think, only with one other person. Mm -hmm. um, looking okay. at the script, we are able to socially distance um, in it. Uh, there's lots of precautions. You know, I have to drive by myself. We have one hair makeup artist. Uh, we'll all be living together. We can't. Oh, interesting. Tyler Perry yeah. style. <laughs> yeah, we'll all be in the same hotel. Like I said, it's, you know, it's a, it's an independent horror film. <laughs> so, oh, so we're able to kind of play things really close to the vest. And okay. um, I think this is how they're able to do it. But you now I went to my wardrobe fitting the other day and um, I had to kind of run, not had to, but got to kind of run my own wardrobe fitting. Right. Right. Because you can't have all that back and forth. Nobody's coming close to me. 
so I'm just kind of changing into things and coming out and going, uh, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and the, the poor um, costume key, Sabina, she she kept wanting to like do things, <laughs> but she's like, oh no, I can't come near you, you know. So right, because it's her, it her first it's her first time as well trying to figure it out. But we're gonna we're gonna work it out. I mean, we were all masked uh, and gloved, uh, not gloved, masked and, and distanced. Uh, I think testing is gonna be a big thing, but I think it's gonna start getting challenging on these bigger shows when you have more people in scenes. Um, I've heard a lot of actors who are really really scared. Um, oh uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Carly Pope. Carly Pope is the lead of the film Unlocked. Oh. Um, yes, I'm so excited to work with Carly. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, so yeah, a Actor National did send out a survey, you know, polling people in the in the industry about how they would feel about intimacy scenes and stunt fighting and anything that's close contact and. I don't really know what to say about it. Um, Cause I don't think anybody knows. Um, I mean, I'm trying to be as mindful as possible. Yes, I've, I've been out at, at protests and at marches. Of course I've been distancing as much as I can and wearing a mask. A lot of people here don't wear masks, but I do. <laughs> um, um, I've Outside of being in those protests, I've been isolated all this time because I came yeah. from a set. Uh, my mother is very high risk. Um, so I would never want to put her in danger. And I haven't, um, I haven't actually hugged my mom in, you know, five months. So yeah, I see her once a week. We kind of stand, you know, apart from each other and catch up for a little while. I call her every day, of course. Oh, that's so great. But, um, but I miss giving her a hug. Um, I have people in my bubble, you know, I, I'm, conscious of that, the contact tracing, uh, there are people I know who can, we can contact trace them. Um, but yeah, um, I think this is just gonna be such a different landscape. I do understand that people are scared though. I, I'm willing to kind of not put myself out there. I'm not, not any kind of uh, hero. Oh, bye Donnie. Donnie's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, for some of our viewers, because they're in Europe and all the yeah, other places around late. the world. Yeah. Some people like, yeah, it's very late or very early or they have to, yeah. Thanks work. for sticking around, guys. Yeah, it's Father's Day weekend. Oh, I got to call my dad. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm, I, I understand that people are afraid and rightfully so. Um, I guess I'm willing to take the risk to kind of see how it's going to work. Um, I am single. Uh, I don't have, like, I'm able to be alone uh, and yeah. kind of keep myself separate if the worst should happen and I do get sick. I, I, I'm not going to come home to a family, um, right, that I'm going to infect. I can stay away right. from my mom. I can keep myself in the house. Um, and so we can kind of see like how it's how it's going to work. Um, we don't know. There have been a lot of young people who have been hospitalized, so I can't call myself low risk. Uh, but I don't have any pre-existing conditions. I'm I'm right. fairly young and healthy, so we're gonna see. Yeah, I wish yeah. masks were mandatory here in Vancouver uh, in Canada. Yeah. Um, I think they should. Them. I think they should they, be. Yeah, they the provinces haven't uh, done it for. They have their reasons. Um, yeah. ma masks are mandatory to me. <laughs> <laughs> and as much as people look at me and like, you know, you're eccentric or, you know, people will say, oh, the numbers aren't very high here in Vancouver or whatever it is. But um, it can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. It's a disease yeah. we don't know much about. You know, I think the idea of targeting people as the cause of outbreaks. I think there's a lot of opportunity for, well, racism <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and really well, discriminatory behavior from people. It's I, like, I there's am, no us and them, you know? Yeah. I am, uh, my mother is ch Chinese, so I am half Chinese. And a lot of people don't always know that, but it's, um, 
yeah, it's very devastating to see see the blatant uh, racism to do with that. Unconscionable, yeah. absolutely unconscionable. I recently read a story of a doctor uh, in New Brunswick, the border of New Brunswick and Quebec, frontline worker, African doctor, studied, you know, but was a, is a doctor in Canada. Um, frontline worker working in the hospitals, working in other clinics. He went to Quebec to pick up his daughter. He had a job interview at another clinic, which is not entirely out of the ordinary because he worked at other places outside of the hospital in the town. Mm -hmm. um, an outbreak happened and he's been blamed for it. He's, um, wow. there's a cr criminal charges are being laid against him. He's been fired from his job, uh, all these kinds of things. And I just think that that's, we gotta work, we gotta work it out guys. <laughs> We have to protect our frontline workers. We we ca Canadians like to uphold themselves as as being um, progressive, and that racism doesn't exist here, and that we are a forward thinking nation. And so I think we need to start behaving like yeah. one. Uh, this country is built on immigrants, uh, your lineage, um, not mine as much, but as as a first generation. I'm not even a first generation Canadian. I'm an immigrant Canadian and the daughter of an immigrant. Um, immigrants are some of the hardest working people you will have in your society. Um, and they are oftentimes the backbones of the economy that they come into. Um, and yeah, we are legacies that have built countries. So everybody just be thankful that you had another doctor <laughs> <laughs> in New Brunswick. And <laughs> let's just, yeah. uh, let's check the, let's check the racism at the door. It's a new day, guys. It's a new yes, day. Yes, absolutely. It's a new day. This is a great opportunity, I think. We're all affected by this disease. It doesn't discriminate. Mm -hmm. uh, on class or race or gender or even age, um, we're all in this dis in in this situation trying to figure it out. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to really be a part of a tr truly progressive uh, society globally. You know. Yes. Yeah. South Africa has done a really great job of of it, although you know. They've had the military on the streets. You can do that in South Africa. Can't do that so much in, in Vancouver. Not going to go over so well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was but. very scary here in LA, I will say that. I, I had nonstop helicopters just like, and they would not stop. And I could f hear the like low hum of, of tanks. And at one point there was a threatened like riot out near, like outside of my uh, home, so I actually like hosed down part of my balcony, <laughs> thinking because people were starting to light like trees on fire, and you know, in addition to like cars and things like that. Oh, no. no, I mean it didn't happen. It didn't happen, but the threat of it happening, like it was in a neighboring neighborhood, and then yeah. I thought it was you know gonna, and so we all kind of battened down the hatches, and it was a really weird feeling for me to be like, oh wow, this is a Eensy weensy taste of what it might feel like if you were in a war zone because it's kind of like not, but it, you know, just like a little taste of I it. I think it is though. And it was think, terrifying. I it yeah, I think terrifying. it is. I think it's a really dire situation down there. Yeah. I, Canada is just not that, you know. <laughs> we are, it, it's just, yeah, smaller population, different governments. Um, but yeah. Uh, I, I called and checked on a lot of my friends in California for the last little while because I was like, what is happening? I think we were Down all there. Feeling, yeah, we were all like, what is happening? Because this Are is you okay? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you guys already live in like an earthquake zone. We do too. Uh, yeah. And between the fires and the drought and the earthquake, I don't know. What are you doing down there? Get out. <laughs> I know. No, we're kidding. I'm All kidding. Of my I love California. I'm not going to say anything. When I'm down there, I'm like, I never want to leave. So, yeah. yeah. No, people are beckoning me to come back, but you know, I, I, I go you. back and forth. Yeah. 
still. Come hang out. It's summertime. It's gorgeous. Everybody's out. I mean, it's like it never happens. I don't know. I'm <laughs> staying in the house. I don't know what's happening. I'm staying in the house. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm like that. I try to get out like once a week, but more just like chilling mm -hmm. with my plants. Yeah. I know. go once a week. Uh, um, once a week, I do my grocery shopping at the farmer's market with my one friend. And then uh, yeah. once, a, once every two weeks, I make dinner uh, with another friend. Um, yeah. That's my bubble. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I oh, wait. Want... What did I see here? Oh. Some scripts are being rewritten. Yes. Lots of script rewriting. Um, I know the writers, sorry, back to the um, Oh, I know some industry. scripts are being rewritten to be more friendly to distancing. I do feel more work coming for uh, visual effects to accommodate distancing on set as well. I know, just as long as they don't start uh, using digitized actors <laughs> instead of us, they're they like, are. oh, we don't need you. Oh, oh, whoops. D didn't you see that? I think it was UTA signed a, a virtual actor and she's a virtual entertainer she's a virtual person but she like, has a signed contract with a like the major agency in los angeles <laughs> yes. so we should clone ourselves digitally and then get signed and then work on our algorithms we're gonna have to pitch ourselves as algorithms and you should see her she's like ethnically ambiguous Shout out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you and I both, you know. More like you than me, but um, yeah, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she's yeah, she's, she, she's ethnically ambiguous. I think she's like a singer and she wants to get into, act. I, look it up. You guys will find it. Uh, it was just, it was in the news not too long ago, probably a month. I was like, well, that's it. Uh, now, and older actors can play the younger versions of themselves and, Younger actors can play the older versions of themselves because they'll just age you. Yeah. Listen, who knows what's going to happen? I, I don't know. Thank God for YouTube, right? <laughs> we can make our own content is what I mean. Like yeah. we can still put out what we want to, to put out into the world. Yeah. I Shout watched... out to your YouTube channel though, babe. Oh, I, thanks. Uh, yeah. Good thanks. on you. I yeah, I just, I just started a couple start. months ago. No, really? Yeah, I you just, like yeah, this is uh, the eighth episode. Lucky eight, yep. I feel like this is just like you've been doing it all this time. Easy peasy. Well, before I was just talking to myself, but you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do that all the time. Is that all? I, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I watched two episodes of your newer show, Lime Town, which for everyone who hasn't seen Lime Town, it's you can watch it for free on Facebook. On Facebook, yeah. Yeah. So you have um one-on-one -on -one scenes with Jessica Beale. And you guys, you play her girlfriend. And I wanted I to ask you when you kiss. Were you just like, I am kissing Justin Timberlake's wife right now? <laughs> I don't think of her as Justin Timberlake's wife. If anything, I think of Justin Timberlake as Mrs. Beale. <laughs> as Mr. Beale. <laughs> Mr. Beale. I definitely just get the sense that he is her husband and not she is his wife. <laughs> oh, really? I have so much respect for Jessica Beale. She's uh she is a lady about her about her word and uh, about her business. Yeah, it was phenomenal working with her. Um yeah, she's like got all the bases covered. She's like married to a superstar, running her show, you know, producing amazing television uh you know and she's a baby the mama center previous that she's a baby mama um she doesn't talk too much about her her family yeah. um yeah i know I, I was getting major uh cred from my friends i was like i get to be just feels girlfriend They're like what what <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got huge points for that one. Not mad at it. Um, she's incredibly professional. Um, oh, wow. Look at me and my blonde hair and my sad face. Um, 
I don't she's think incredibly that professional. It was so great to to run scenes with her. Uh, she's so talented. The kiss, I mean, you know what kissing is like on camera. There's so many people watching and in a way it's kind of, it's more about like, where it's got to be on the lens, you know? And, yeah, it's um, it's very technical, very technical. Yeah, and also, I am trying to be respectful because she is, you know, a married woman. So I don't want to... <laughs> it's the same thing. I mean, with two... You, you can't be too handsy, you know? Consent is real. So we had mm. results and all that stuff. And uh, I think I made her blush a couple times. Um... And I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah, it's a cool show. So I encourage people to check out Lime Town on I Facebook. Uh, another battle, couple of more Battlestar alumni in that show, Rika Sharma and Alessandra Giuliani. You'll see on that show. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. cool. Who do you look up to, actor wise? Ooh. Ooh, there's a lot of people. Um, I love Tandy Newton's work. Yes. I've loved Tandy Newton's work for a long time. I know that's that's sort of an easier one because people will say that we look alike. I don't, she's much finer features than I do, but we are the same shade. If that, <laughs> that's as close as we come. Um, I'm happy to be in the same arena as, if anybody wants to put me in the same arena as Tandy Newton. Um, I've loved her work for, for decades. I think she's uh, subtle and uh, stunning. Um, uh, who put Molly's game? Oh, Jessica Chastain is mm -hmm. out of this world. Um, I have the biggest lady crush on Gillian Anderson you have ever had in your life. <laughs> She's so great. Um, oh my goodness! Uh, I mean, there's there's I, the icons of um, Tracy Ellis Ross or Cicely Tyson, uh, Viola Davis. I mean, there's power in Viola Davis. That uh, I just love how unapologetic mm -hmm. she is as an actor. Uh, just in like her full throated choices mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and how do i say this not always needing to sort of like make it tv you know what i mean or or make right it's like you cry but keep it cute no just cry <laughs> you know just yeah. um uh and take those moments um Oh my goodness. Okay, let me let me try and broaden the field a little bit. I mean, we have to shout out our local legend, Sandra O. Oh. Um <laughs> she's amazing. Um have, have you worked with her ever? No. Okay. I've come we've been sort of ships in the night. <laughs> But I, I recently spoke about um and, and watched uh, Meditation Park that she directed. <gasps> Um, but just, yeah. oh, and what a love story to, uh, Vancouver Wait, did she, and I don't, did she did direct she, it? Oh no, I she didn't direct it. No, she was in I think, it. Sorry. I thought that it. was, yeah. Mina Shum. I thought it was Mina Shum. I'm so sorry. Cause she was speaking at one of the TIFF panels uh, mm. about it and she's, uh, the producer. Sorry. She, produced, yeah. she didn't direct my, uh, my mistake, but, um, yeah, what a, what a love song to, um, to Vancouver and to um, and to the Chinese community here. Yeah, to Asian um, culture. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I could, could go for a long time. Uh, <laughs> I recently saw a clip. Um. Well, topically, um, independent film starring Nikki Bahari. Uh, called Juneteenth uh, that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Uh, Nikki Bahari is also um, an actress that I've, I mean, we're we're not in the same milieu, but we are sort of, I've auditioned uh, 
against Nikki Bahari a few times. Yeah. <laughs> She's always gotten the job. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Really? <laughs> Uh, because she's phenomenal. Um, Anika Noni Rose, um, I really enjoy. Um, yeah, lots of folks. Uh, our local, uh, it, ooh, Chayla Horsdale. If you haven't seen Chayla Horsdale on um, uh, Man in High Castle. Uh, oh, I haven't. Chayla can do no wrong. She's one of the most naturally... Uh, gifted actresses at mm. she's yeah she's like magic she's got like magic vibes <laughs> I don't know what that's about she wins everything we all can't stand it but we all just love her <laughs> nothing you can do about it <laughs> yeah um I'll go on and on but yeah that's good <laughs> what are your favorite roles to play and what is a role that you've always wanted to play oh um I, I don't know about my favorite roles because I mean I play the roles that I get to play you know what I mean mm -hmm. um I like roles um I like roles that have more substance than being uh, like I don't like playing the girlfriend or the wife or the best friend. <laughs> the Although accessory. <laughs> the accessory. Yeah. As as actors of, of color, um, and particularly within certain networks, uh -huh. mm. you know who you are, <laughs> MOW world. Um, yeah. You understand this. For a long time, as actors of color, it's not like you could say, or be sort of foolhardy to be like, oh, I want to play that role, because it just may not be that you got to do that, you know? I've been told many times in my career, we're not going to have any interracial couples on this role. So that, there's a whole bunch of parts that I don't get to play. You know, I always have to right. play a role that's kind of singular. She's unattached to anybody around her, because because I can't have a spouse of a different uh, ethnicity or how would they cast my kids or who's gonna be my mother or what is she or you know, all that kind of nonsense. It's changing now. Yeah. Uh, thank goodness, but um, yeah, I, you know, you wanna play the parts of people who drive the story. <laughs> I wanna play a therapist. I think that's one of my, I think I wanna, we'll put that in the repertoire. I've gotten to do a lot of like military. I got to be kind of a boss lady on V Wars, which was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that a lot. Oh um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think a, a photo of you. From, yeah. Yeah. I need more power suits. I think that's the deal. I think I need to, and I wanna play, I've always been like sweet characters or, oh, there she is, Claire is this O'Hagan. So this is you on V Wars. Yeah. Did you really dye your hair blonde? Or is well, that a wig? My hair, my hair is blonde from Limetown. Oh. Limetown dyed my hair blonde. Okay. Uh, and then it rolled over into this. It was a little different. And I do actually have, um, I have a few hair pieces in, but that's mostly my hair. Gorgeous. Uh, you, yeah. you are so versatile, like you look great in a ton of different ways. It's it was really magical. Yeah, it destroyed my hair, which is why it's cut all of it off. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun while I had it, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I need more power suits. I need to play more villains and more women in charge. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, some fun manipulations. Um, that web series that I created by uh, my friend Jean Angusen, that was a that was a romantic comedy. That was a rom com, so that was a lot of fun too. I I've spent a lot of years crying and dying, and oh. we're gonna we're gonna slow down on the on the crying and the dying. You know what I mean? You're also really good at comedy. I saw on an old demo reel of yours where. Oh. 
you did this really cutesy kind of, you know, Christmas scene with the mistletoe. Oh. And, and you were so funny. You're only as good as the actor in the scene. No, uh, uh, Jenny McCarthy is hilarious and you can't not be funny in a scene with her. That's, uh -huh. you, she just makes you funny. Um, that was a fun, Santa baby. Yeah, they still play <laughs> it. I love Santa baby, that was fun. She's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, that was fun. She, I'm like her assistant and I'm sort of an elf. I'm like the real world version of her, cause she's Santa and I'm her elf. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if they made that same one today, I don't think I don't think that would I, it, it wouldn't come out the same way um, in the current climate of things. Absolutely, um, and I don't think I'll ever play a role like that again. But uh, for the time, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. We got to go dog sledding, uh, and we for real went dog sledding, and those dogs run so fast. <laughs> And we're like in the backwoods, in the snow, and like, like <laughs> oh, I thought we were gonna bail so many times. I wasn't worried about it because the snow was fresh and it was really soft, and so you know, that's okay. But mm. <laughs> <laughs> they're powerful. They're gorgeous. That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, oh, thanks, I guys. Yeah. Do you I'm, have? I'm just, uh, chatting to people in your comments. Thank you. Oh, everyone loves you. I love, yes, thank you to everyone in the live chat. It's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna just do a few more questions if that's cool. Okay. I mean, I think this is cool too because I'm so used to being home alone that it's like nice to talk to somebody too. Oh, this is this is all the interaction. I I mean, this is the greatest. I I basically is, racking up the interviews just so I can have somebody to talk to. Every day. It's like it's like an extended FaceTime. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your photo shoot with Toro magazine because oh my god, how long it, ago was that? That was a million years ago. Like. You are so freaking, respectfully, you are so freaking hot in this oh. photo shoot. I can't Thanks. even handle, like, you guys look at her. Like, this is crazy. I mean, uh, this, is, this is, I mean, it's just insane. It's just It's insane. one of the best pictures of me, that's for sure. Um, Daryl did an amazing job. This piece of hair, whoever's in the hair industry, tell me. My hair looked amazing yesterday, um, but I had to do it today. I had to blow dry my hair and this is what you get. Uh, <laughs> um, I went out on a limb with that photo shoot. Uh, the photographer was Daryl Humphrey. He's mm -hmm. a photographer out of the UK. Uh, Tara approached me directly and I think they were still kind of, they were an established magazine at the time, but um, yeah, you know, I was at a point in my career, I was like, well, I'm never gonna be as young or as hot as I am right now. Um, so, sure let me go take some pictures um i mm -hmm. didn't anticipate that it was going to be as uh, naked as it was um <laughs> i had requested uh that i would be able to veto anything that i didn't feel like or approve of yeah um and i did veto uh but it was largely ignored actually oh I hope I didn't. And, um, no, 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 no. Post Listen, anything that you're. Yeah. They're beautiful shots. They've been out in the world for so long. I'm just glad it's just for a long time when you Googled my name, uh, like horse porn would show up because I'm on a horse no. and, and people it would like that would. Thank God that doesn't happen anymore. But like, that's what I, and then I didn't expect that like as much as my boobs were showing and like all this kinds of stuff. So uh, at the time oh, it was a little cringy for me, but, um, but they're beautiful pictures. And beautiful. Um, I worked my ass off to be ready for that photo shoot. Uh, so, oh, like yeah. physically you worked I out? Did Bikram, like I did Bikram yoga every day. I would jog to yoga. I would do a hot yoga class and then I would jog back from yoga uh, every day. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. I mean, some of those hot yoga classes, minimum 400 calories, 
minimal. Like I don't do Bikram yoga anymore. Yeah. I'll do hot yoga. Well, not a, that was the before times. Um, yeah. <laughs> the before times when we got to do hot yoga. I don't know if we're going to get to do that again. But I love hot yoga. I just do a different kind now. It's more gentle, more flow. You know, more yeah. restore. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I enjoy being physical and I like working out. I work out every. Well, three, four times a week here in my in this apartment. <laughs> I do kettlebells and, uh, you know, try and stay on top of it. But um, I am proud of that shoot. Uh, it, Daryl did a great job. The styling was beautiful. We kind of laid a good dive the thing. And those are the sexiest shots. Um, well, no, that's not true. I did a beautiful coffee table book shot by TJ Scott, the director TJ Scott. Oh. Also worked with him. Um, well, he works on everything, but the last time I worked with him was on V Wars, um, and he did um, beautiful coffee table book as a fundraiser for breast cancer. A lot of faces that you would know in there, um, and that was in the tub. Is called in the tub yeah. with TJ Scott. Yeah. yeah. So those, but I'm I'm a lot more covered up in the tub than I am on that horse. <laughs> Well, I brought up the Toro magazine because I had seen a video of the making of the behind the scenes of that shoot. And it yeah. looked like the horse was was really like kind of uh, scared of your hair um, piece. Yeah. And so, you know, how vulnerable for you to be, you know, not really, you know, wearing that much. And like you hear you've got a horse, you know. I was not afraid. Yeah, I was weirdly not afraid at all. Um, that horse, all he wanted to do was eat and poop. <laughs> so he was really less concerned about me. He wasn't super jazzed about my hairpiece. Mm. Uh, <laughs> um, but I get along with animals and babies. Uh, I think I speak their language. Because uh, yep. I'm definitely more... I think I'm more in the spurt world than I am here. My 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 therapist calls me Faye. <laughs> I'm definitely more out there than I am down here. Uh, so I, mm -hmm. I can I can talk to animals and babies. We get along. So I just I just hung out yeah. with them for a bit. I just chatted them up. Um, I let him know that we were going to hang out together and um, <laughs> that everything was cool. And then he was super chill. He let me like lay down on him. Yeah. I was like backwards. I was staring all kinds of stuff. That's really um, cool. And yeah, I it was high up off the ground, um, and I was not wearing much. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I like challenging things. I like yeah. fun, challenging things. You know. When do you I see to that. Do that. I see that in you, <laughs> like a willingness to just go there. It makes my mother crazy. <laughs> my poor mom. <laughs> really. Yeah, because I'm always like, oh, it's fine. I'm just going to go try it. I'm just going to go do it. It's going to be fun. She's like, why? Why? Why would you do that? I'm like, because how else do you learn about yourself Yeah, if you don't put yourself in challenging situations? Well, it's funny that you get, um, you said you get compared sometimes to Thandie Newton uh, visually. And I almost got more of a Rihanna thing from that photo shoot, which oh, I just think are, she's such a stunner as well. People are incredibly sweet. Um, I do get Rihanna quite a bit. Um, I'm so flattered by that. Um, more so because Rihanna is doing such amazing things in the world. Yeah. <laughs> she's actually yeah. putting her money where her, where her heart is um, in a lot of ways and really um, standing up for women and girls and, and, and education. Um, so yeah, I'll take the comparison to Rihanna. People say that I look like Rihanna, but Rihanna looks like me because I am a solid decade older than Rihanna. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's crazy. So you can thank me for Rihanna. No, I'm kidding. Wow. <laughs> I, I used to get Lisa Bonet as well. Yeah. When I have my braids. That in, is, yes, that is I very... Get, Oh, you can really see my bra through that shirt. I really love to wear a see-through <laughs> shirt. I'm just noticing, like all I have is like see-through shirt. 
But here's the thing, you weren't probably that see-through until the flash of a million cameras on the on the red carpet hit you and then now I should have thought about that though cuz I was dressing for the red carpet. Listen, here's so here's the thing that happens. When you travel with uh like a entourage you call it when you can check it no, uh, carry on. When you travel with oh. carry on size luggage and maybe one other bag and a backpack, not always because I have to carry my ukulele, so that's an extra thing. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make do with the options that you brought. Um, and sometimes you just got to throw an outfit together. So yeah. that's what that was. I was traveling from somewhere else. I'd come from the East Coast, I had gone to my storage locker before going in transit, went to my storage locker, pulled out a couple of clothes, uh, swapped things over in my carry-on, went back to the airport, and that was the outfit that came out. So when I realized that I didn't have anything to wear under it, and that was the bra that I'd pulled out, that's, that's what's going on. So that was a happy <laughs> accident. I think you look stunning. I mean, I, I don't think anyone has a problem uh, with what you're wearing at all. I mean, I, mean, I don't have I that many have clothes. clothes. Well, I do. I do have a lot of clothes. I have a lot more than the average bear because uh, I collect them and I like going to secondhand stores. But I like yeah. I. Um, so the way I, when I'm traveling a lot, I have like, I have wardrobe capsules. I have things that I know I can just grab, and they'll all sort of go together one way or mm -hmm. the other depending yeah. on what I need to do. So I have sort of several of those in kind of color collections. Right. Um, so yeah, this was a this was a particular capsule. I love that shirt though. I'm obsessed with like vintage Korean like mm. company woman's clothes. I have a few like Korean suits. Um, that is a Korean silk blouse. Um, and they're all from like the 60s and 70s. 60s, 70s, and 80s, I have a lot of those. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I'm about it. I'm about, I'm about the Korean company woman's outfits. <laughs> and, and did you raid your mom's old clothes too for all of the pieces she had that were yes. from My back mom in gave the day? Away a lot of, well, she gave away a lot of her clothes, remember, because she immigrated and then we moved around so much. Um, okay. As young. I, I bust her chops about it all the time because I'll come out in something and she'd be like, oh, I had a skirt like that when I was 16. And I'm like, and where? And where is it now? I had to go and buy the skirt. I had to go to Valley Village and find the skirt. <laughs> where you where is that? given it to me and yeah. what are we doing? Um, she's cute. No, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, so my grandmother, however, uh, was a seamstress. Her... Uh, brother was also a seamstress, a, a, a pattern maker. Uh, mm -hmm. He had a woman's clothing line that he made for my grandmother. So I've raided my grandmother's closet and I have so many beautiful one of a kind uh, pieces that either my grandmother has made or that she bought and kept for 50 years. Um, and I wear them all the time. Um, yeah, they're some of my favorite well, items of clothing. And they also had such interesting jewelry. Like I raided my grandma's, um, you know, she had uh, some rhinestone necklace and, you know, stuff like that, you know, from years and years ago. And yeah, those are special my pieces. Granny kept the jewelry close. We only got the jewelry like uh, as our gift. So like I've got, um, mm -hmm. I've got a, a diamond, sort of little diamond solitaire that she gave me for my 21st birthday and, you know, little things, like my mom's wedding ring, um, little things like that. Um, but my aunt Nina, now she had all the good jewelry. <laughs> she still does. She keeps the collection of it. Now she has all these beautiful uh, semi-precious stones and um, I may have to start rating that. Well, I was going to ask, does she have daughters or can you be next in line? <laughs> For if she's You're looking ever at her. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. You're looking at her right here. Well, no, she <laughs> wears a lot of them because she's an impeccably dressed woman, my mm -hmm. Aunt Nina. So, yeah, 
she she's definitely wearing them, but one of these days. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. She taught me about gemstones. She's the oh, reason really? that I could tell the difference between labradorite and, you know, whatever else, smoky quartz. Mm -hmm. Well, it's cool. I mean, even South Africa, platinum, gold, diamonds. Oh, everything. I mean, yeah. Know, all, yeah. All the things. Yeah. All the things. Yeah. 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 And you are the jewel as well coming oh. from there. <laughs> I don't. I don't wear a lot of jewelry right now. I just wear. A, I have a selenite pendant um, that my dear friend's aunt uh, Colette gave to me. Colette the Wanderer. Mm -hmm. um, I wear that every day. Uh, my friend Alonzo or Yarson uh, started making jewelry. He was on Battlestar. He was one of the the grunts in the hangar bay. Mm. Uh, he's got a jewelry company now, Carcel Hill. So uh, he's been making me beautiful um, semi-precious bracelets. He made me one for my birthday, one in my birthstone, and then another one for like protection and abundance. Uh, not, and my mom's... not a bad friend to have. Not a bad. Friend I know. To have. I know. I got the hookup. I was like, <laughs> hey, Zo. hi. Um, and then I wear one of my mom's um, wedding rings. And I have a ring, uh, a vintage ring. It's a Victorian, um, it's a Victorian, no, is it Victorian? Edwardian, Edwardian or Georgian? Anyway, when they used to go to balls. So it's a maiden's ring. It's a made out of rose gold and a stone called chrysoprase. And it's a teardrop. And so, uh, sorry, this hand. You wear it teardrop pointy side out um, if you're available. And you wear it teardrop in if you are taken. So when the gentlemen would come and greet you, they would be able to tell if you were available uh, to dance that night. <laughs> mm. Very that interesting. Mm -hmm. That's basically the only jewelry I wear. I don't have pierced ears, so. Oh, really? I wear clip-ons, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh. I have keloids, so my body just rejects them. What does that mean? Um, so, predominantly people of African American or African descent. I'm not African American, I am African though. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically um, hyper production of collagen. So, okay. if you scar or you, like anywhere your body experiences trauma, it'll like overproduce collagen and it'll make um, kind of risen, like white risen scars. Oh, not, not always yeah. right, but okay. like, yeah, so it's, it like over scars. Oh, interesting. So it takes a long time to heal. But with regards to piercing, basically what would happen is that it would push the ring out, the, the piercing out. Right. Like my body would literally grow skin to the point where it would just pop right, right out of my ear. <laughs> so did you ever have your ears pierced? Yes, I tried. I tried twice to pierce my ears, and I tried twice um, to pierce my belly button. That I was sixteen. My best friend and I did it on our sixteenth birthday. Anyway, no, I I, but I tried it. twice. Didn't work. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No piercing for me. Hmm. Oh, excuse me, you guys. Sorry. I'm gonna wow. cough. I'm gonna drink some water. No, it's all right. <laughs> wow, we all just learned something about you. Um, before... You've learned a little too much. I, will <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate how, how open you've been. Um, before we wrap up, I do yeah. want to talk about someone who uh, you really admire. And I, I was really, uh, I did not know of this person until you brought them up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring up the photo. And please tell us about this beautiful human being. I know who you're going to talk about. There she is. So for, for our audience, can you please tell us who this is? You were looking at a picture of a young Viola Desmond. Uh, Viola Desmond was a black Nova Scotian, a black Canadian. Um, she was an entrepreneur. She ran a beauty school. She had a beauty shop, Vi's Beauty Shop. Um, most notably, though, uh, 
she's known as a Canadian civil rights um, icon. I hesitate to call her an activist because she wouldn't have called herself an activist mm. from what I've learned of Miss Viola. Um, but she sat in a movie theater, very much the way that Rosa Parks sat on a bus, um, not as premeditated. She just wanted to watch a movie, her car had broken down. Um, and she was waiting for a part and thought to watch a film. Uh, but she sat in the wrong section apparently and they wouldn't take her money um, to sit there. And she, they called the police and she was uh, forcibly removed from the theater and thrown in jail. Um, she didn't fight the case right away, but she eventually did take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And though it didn't work out in her favor at the time, uh, after very many, many years, um, she, it did signal a change in tide in, in Canada and in the, in the system of racial justice in this country. Um, that court case was, was pivotal to acknowledging racism in Canada and within the black community um, in Canada at large and, and bringing light to the wealth of history uh, that black Canadians bring to this country. Now, mm. I am not black Canadian. By black Canadian, I mean descendants of, um, I wouldn't say repatriated people. They were slaves uh, from the Southern colonies in the United States that were brought up to the East Coast of Canada to settle it. Um, they were offered land and many of those families made good uh, on that opportunity and, uh, and built homes and built families and, and businesses only to have them bulldozed by the Canadian government. And uh, Viola and her family faced um, every kind of imaginable uh, oppression and limitation because of their skin color. And she fought her whole life uh, to, to overcome that. Uh, I played her in a, Canadian, in a CBC Historica Canada Heritage Minute, something we have here in Canada. They come on TV, they're 30 seconds uh, to a minute of um, you know, some part of Canadian history. Uh, they're excellently produced. I can't say enough about Historica Canada and the work that they do. Uh, I owe them some work. <laughs> uh, um, um, but um, yeah, after learning about Viola Desmond, I'm just really passionate about her story. Um, my producing partner and I uh, are writing, well, she's writing. <laughs> I'm helping <laughs> as much as I possibly can uh, the story of Viola Desmond because everybody knows Rosa Parks. Um, Viola Desmond sat in that theater. I've said it before and I'll say it again, almost a decade before Rosa Parks. Um, and we should have Viola's name on our lips the way that Americans have Rosa Parks. Now, uh, she is uh, on our money. So I was looking for my purse, but it's in the front hall. Uh, she is on our $10 bill. Um, there she is, the only other woman other than the queen. <laughs> <laughs> to be on Canadian currency. And we are desperately proud uh, of that. Um, I've gotten to speak to her living sister, one of her living sisters, Miss Wanda Robson, who has advocated for Viola. So Viola received a full and free pardon from the Canadian government in 2010, which is to say that she did nothing wrong, but that the, the laws of the land were wrong and they mm -hmm. apologized. Um, and uh, yeah, I just do as much as I can to, to spread the word about uh, Viola Desmond and um, have her be the, the model, the role model that she was in her life, in her community when she lived. She was incredibly instrumental in her community, incredibly instrumental. And just to think, this is post-war North America, right? We're at the height of Jim Crow in the United States. And here is a 32 year old, um, sure, light skinned, but she still was not allowed to attend school. She couldn't go to hairdressing school in Canada. Nobody would take her. There were no schools for that. She went to the States to study. She came back inspired by Madam CJ Walker and opened a beauty school, um, 32 years old, bought a brand new car cash, driving around Nova Scotia, selling her products like, ah, I can do anything. 
you mm -hmm. know, she felt like she could do anything. And then just to be stopped in her tracks over sitting in a movie theater, uh, she couldn't reconcile it. And, and she fought, you know, the rest of her life to, to make that right. And um, the Canada then is not the Canada now. Um, we do enjoy the freedoms of a multicultural society, but I think to deny racism in this country is wrong. Slavery existed in Canada for 200 years, whereas prejudicial laws were not explicit, they were under Jim Crow. They did exist. We couldn't study here. We mm -hmm. couldn't uh, get into certain kinds of jobs. Um, there were, they bulldozed Africville in Nova Scotia. They completely wiped out that community. Mm -hmm. Now, the government of Nova Scotia did pay reparations. Oh, there goes my headphones, sorry. Um, uh, to those families. Oh, just tell me when you lose me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think Viola Desmond's story should be, um, should be taught in schools and everybody should know who she is. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. <laughs> yes. Well, <clears throat> I would not have known about her or her story or even the fact that she's on the $10 bill. Mind you, I have not been living in. Yeah, you know. you're in a different country. <laughs> yeah. But um, so thank you for for sharing that and educating us on that really important piece of history. She's and a I, phenomenal woman. Yeah. And I really, really am cheering you on on the sidelines that you do that project. And I think uh, now more than ever is a fantastic time where I feel like you I could walk so into a studio and someone would absolutely want to, to make that so happen. I think yeah. so too. And I think the time is right. I think what's most important you know, to my partner and I is that we honor uh, her legacy and her story. You know, this is going to be the story of her. This is what people will reference when it's made. So um, we want that to be as honest and as um, as beautiful as, as we can possibly make it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. It takes a long time. People think, you know, you just whip up a beat. I can tell you. Passion projects. Oh, my gosh. Seven years is, I think, is I read was the average from idea to production. Woo. Yeah, Thanks. I'm good. We're we're on our way. I think I'm in year five. So I, I think oh, it's gonna happen. Wow. Gonna <laughs> I don't think it has to take seven years. No, no. no. Yeah, we're, we're gonna change that. Yeah, I just love yeah. that so much. So. Uh, to wrap up, final two things. What projects do you have coming up? You talked about you're about to film. Um, yes. Any, anything else coming out? Well, yes. you've got tons um, of stuff going. <laughs> Netflix, Facebook, um, you know. Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, so um, Artist's Way Out, created by Jean Ann Goosen, um, is still in post-production at the moment. And we don't know what platform that'll be out, but I'll definitely be talking about it. That's uh, the web series rom-com. So proud of it and so proud of Jean Ann. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, no, the episode of Charmed aired already. So I'm not sure if I'm, I'll be coming back, but fingers crossed, you'll see me, yeah. hopefully you'll see me back on Charmed. I had a great uh, time on that show. And then, uh, yeah, Unlocked. Um, with uh, Carly Pope, uh, directed by Neil Blomkamp, uh, coming up soon. Um, and other than that, uh, I don't know, ask me next week. <laughs> no, that's terrible. I'm so grateful. I am so deeply grateful to be a working actress. I can't, I don't have to tell you. We're, we're lucky to be able to do the job that we do, and I'm just, Thank you so much to all the fans out there who keep watching my work. Uh, you really, you keep food on my table uh, and keep me being able to take care of my family. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I was going to ask, do you have a message for the fans? Always just gratitude. 
Yeah, it's always just gratitude. Um, there's so much out there. Um, there's so much out there. Uh, and, you know, for people to invite you into their homes and to spend some time with you, uh, the people who follow my career, uh, who follow me on, on Instagram and on, uh, thank you. <laughs> I never know, you know, if I'm sharing too much or not enough. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I appreciate them being there. It makes you feel like you're not so alone and that you can try things and that um, there's some really remarkable people in the world, like people that I've never met that will like remember my birthday or like wish me well on an audition. And I just, it's, from when this, is your birthday? This kid from South Africa could not have imagined it. Um, I my birthday is on March the twenty second. Uh, oh, I am on the, the vernal birthday. equinox. Yes. <laughs> nice spring baby. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank I just you. think the world of you. I just think you are a radiant person inside and out, and you are such a strong female role model for so many people oh. and thank you for for stepping up and putting yourself out there and and always showing up to create such beautiful stories and work and sharing your soul and and your heart and i'm mm -hmm. i'm not going to cry i'm not going to cry no. <laughs> but i just <laughs> i just really uh it's been such a pleasure you know you and i have all, so many um mutual friends but it's really yeah. been a pleasure sitting down with you and i hope that you and i can hang out uh in the future when we're in the same city and you know or even this if you been... want to do this again <laughs> yeah this has yeah. been so much fun like i said we've known each other like known of each other for so long um yeah. i love the people that you know and are friends with so naturally yeah. but um uh, thank you for all that you've been doing, your positive attitude, uh, the courage that you've had to make the strides in your own career. And oh, uh, <laughs> no, it's not easy out there. It's not easy. And um, especially when, you know, we're women alone and we're um, actresses of color and you really have to forge your own path. And you have done that with so much delight for the craft and for the people in it. And it really shines through. So. Thank, Thank you to you, you as well. Can we please hang out? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I actually would just love to even show you like all of my plants and my, That's you what know. I was going to say. I'll show you my sourdough. You can show me your sweet potatoes. It'll be so great. <laughs> It's so funny. Oh, oh my gosh. Um, so for everyone watching, I have linked all of her social media and IMDb mm -hmm. and, and all the all the wonderful things in the description links below. So please, if you haven't already, follow Candace McClure. She's just such Damn. a wonderful person. Yes. Hit that like button, comment, <laughs> like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for saying that so I don't have to. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos this quarantine. I know what goes I know what goes down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Subscribe, subscribe. That's great. Thank you so much. My well, lots you. of love to everyone out there. Be well, stay safe, and uh, we both love you all very much. Uh, big hugs to everyone from around the world for watching. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again, Candace. You are just thank such a so lovely much. person. I just love you. Anyway, this thanks. has made my day. Thank you to everybody <laughs> out there. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we will see you in the next video. All right. Bye. Love you. Thank <laughs> you.